evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Strats Free Lounge, episode 51. Got to get to that second hundred somehow, I suppose. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, I'm seeing from the comments stream here that it's uh, cold out there in the rest of the country. It's chilly-ish here in uh, sunny Los Angeles. It's not where some of you guys are. I'm seeing reports of below zero temperatures, one degree Fahrenheit. What do we got out here in uh, beautiful downtown Burbank? Currently, it is... 61 degrees, but out there in the rest of the comment stream uh, section of the world, it looks like it's about a degree above uh, zero, 58 in Arizona, all kinds of weather reports coming in. Bottom line is, uh, it's uh, it's a little chilly out there compared to um, uh, what we, even typical December day. It's like global warming in full effect, no doubt. Uh, you know, it just can't laugh at this stuff because it's not really funny, I guess. But I will say, um, this was, remember, uh, according to Al Gore, this was going to be the time of the the most uh, god-awful uh, hurricanes in the history of the world. We've never seen hurricanes like this before. Quietest hurricane season in history, I think, in recorded history. Fewest storms ever and later. So um, what do you say to that other than, ha uh, ha, you know, the the weather thing, uh, just as a quick introductory rant, is um, is remarkable because we obviously had the global warming uh, scare where it was getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And as long as it kept getting hotter, global warming was the problem. And we would deal with all the problems that would come from the ice caps melting and the Greenland ice shelf melting. And then all these countries are going to go underwater. So we got to pitch them some money. And all we can really do is uh, shut down capitalism. It's our only, it's our only hope. Uh, as many people pointed out, modern greens are really watermelons, right? They're green on the outside, but they're red on the inside. That second world had to go somewhere. Uh, remember, the third world is the third world because it wasn't the first world, which was the free capitalist world, or the second world, which was the communist world. So, you know, where did where did a third of the world's people go when uh, communism fell? Their beliefs didn't go away. A lot of it went into the green movement, which used to be about protecting us from pollutions, which is a grand idea. Keeping mercury out of rivers is a great idea. I remember the Cleveland River caught fire when I was a kid when Dennis Kucinich was just a boy uh, king. Um, and... Uh, Nevertheless, now that um, CO2 is the culprit, we had this global warming scare for years. And then something happened which really was a little alarming to the global warming alarmists, and that was it stopped warming and stopped warming about the time they started to announce global warming. They had about 18 years of warming, uh, consistent warming, uh, statistically significant warming is the term we're looking for, I think. And so they said, well, run away greenhouse gases. And then right when they started this trumpet blaring, uh, it stopped warming and pretty much became more or less stationary. Uh, and then when it became stationary, you couldn't just say, I'm wrong, because that would be the intellectually honest thing to do. If you didn't have an axe to grind, if you were just a scientist and you really were just pushing scientific theory, you would say, well, we were we were right to be alarmed because we saw a very steep incline, and uh, it seems to have stopped. Uh, the models that we have that predict that warming should just increase as carbon dioxide increases are diverging from the actual data set. That means there's something wrong with our models. We will refine our models using this new information and see if we can come up with a better predictor of climate in the future. Uh, that's what an intellectually honest scientist would have done, but that's not what's happening out there. So once they began to realize that they were losing the evidence for the warming, they started having all these emails go back and forth about, oh, we've got to cover this up. We can't reveal this. If the, if, the, uh, if the skeptics find out that it's not actually warming, then they'll take that to mean that it's not warming. When we know it's warming, this is just a small gap in the warming, and the fact that the evidence is that it's not warming is not going to deter us from our theory because our computer models say that it's warming. The computer models that we made ourselves say that it's warming. And by the way, this is the kind of arrogance that you get from scientists, or not just scientists. Scientists is not the word I was looking for. Authorities is the word I was looking for. So what happens when you get authorities a hold of things? So authorities make climate models and um, the climate models predict a certain rise. And when the rise doesn't match the atmosphere, they compare their uh, computer model to the atmosphere, and they conclude that the atmosphere is wrong. Um, an example I've used before is that a, it's, a, it's a person who's a map maker, and they think that you know, they're, down in the, they're down in the bilges basically drawing this beautiful map that they put their entire work into, and the map indicates that right now they should be off of um, a river delta. And they go up to the bridge, and they look outside with their own two eyeballs, and instead of seeing a river delta, they see a mountain range, and they compare the map to the coastline, and they conclude that the coastline is wrong. Um, so uh, that's what we're dealing with here. So the point I'm trying to make uh, as far as this global warming thing is, once it became no longer global warming, once it became climate change, 
then the game's over. Because, uh, as I've pointed out before, there's never been a period in the Earth's history where the climate wasn't changing. And you can say with absolute scientific certainty that the Earth has been far hotter than it is now. It's been far colder. It's been, there's been more carbon dioxide. There's been a lot less carbon dioxide. Uh, the climate's been in a state of perpetual change all the time. When you talk about climate change, you're granting the case that this is all hooey. You know, uh, it's, it's been in a state of constant flux. There's never been a day in the Earth's history where the climate, not the weather, the climate wasn't changing. Um, the entire center of the United States used to be a, a, a shallow sea, 100 feet deep, 200 feet deep, all through Kansas. is why you can find fossils of, uh, of uh, trilobites in, in Kansas and Missouri, because the great vast inland plains, the great plains of America, were the, were the sediment of an inland sea. And the reason it was an inland sea was because all the ice in the polar caps had melted. And the reason they'd melted was because the earth was far, far, far warmer than it is today. Likewise, at that very same spot where you can find that, um, that uh, ocean life sitting out there in the middle of the uh, plains of Kansas, right underneath where you would find the um, trilobite that said that that was once an inland sea, and it was, you'd also be able to find scattered around evidence that this whole area is once under a, a sheet of ice a mile thick because of the last ice age, which came much, much later than the um, inland sea, which means that the mile of ice above you meant that the earth was much colder than it is now. And so it's been changing in Kansas and everywhere else in the world nonstop, continuously before we ever got on the scene. And the idea that we're responsible for, for this is kind of silly. Sun's doing some interesting things right now that it wasn't doing when I was a boy. It's misbehaving itself in ways that I don't generally associate with the sun, although, again, not without precedent, we're now in solar max. We should be seeing the maximum amount of solar activity on the sun. In fact, we're seeing very, very, very little solar activity, which means it's probably going to get colder as the sun goes back into its 11-year dip on its 22-year cycle. It'll be heading into solar minimum, coming off a very, very low, historically low solar max. Even these cycles are understood. Uh, there's also indications that the sun is, um, is about to uh, undergo a magnetic field reversal. The Earth is also showing that. All these things are, are factors. Um, but the fact is, the data is not matching their models, so the data has to be wrong. And that's all you need to know about these guys, because it's not just the money. People say it's money, there's research money, and there is that. But there's also, um, there's also the political aspect, and our side believes in the truth. And if the truth is unpleasant, then we face the unpleasant truth and try to find a situation around it. It's unpleasant that people like to uh, steal and grab power and lie about it. But we can't pretend that that's not the case the way the liberals do. And what we'll do is we'll say, well, since people want to steal and grab tower, power and lie, we'll have to just deal with that and try to build a system to prevent that from happening mechanically. Uh, likewise, when our models and our uh, data don't match, um, we'll take a look at what's wrong with the model. And, the, and, and you've noticed also that the global warming, uh, sorry, the climate change, sorry, the soon-to-be global cooling, and by the way, it's always been global cooling because Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Um, once once it begins to settle down on people that it's actually getting colder, then this will be a new crisis that will also require the shutting down of capitalism. And my God, I, you know, I just hope that happens simply because I'd really just like to be driving down the 405 freeway in my uh, 2012 Camaro and be able to look over at a guy driving a Prius and say, you know, just roll down the window. Well, he can roll down his window. Uh, I'll power mine down and and say, hey, man, you know, you couldn't do anything to help prevent this climate catastrophe? You couldn't drive a V8? How many miles to the gallon does that thing get? 40. 40? Don't you understand? It's only because I'm, I'm revving this car up to 6,000 RPM to get home that, that I'm putting out 12 miles per gallon and doing my level best to stop this catastrophe of cooling that you Prius owners have brought upon this poor benighted planet. That would be a fun day. I really wish I could modify my uh, Camaro so that I could actually literally do an afterburn on it. I just like to put little burners in the back of the tailpipe and uh, just have a kind of a just sort of a, a gasoline atomizer, just an aerosol injection of gasoline, just when I wanted to, just when I'm going up the hill passing certain cars, I just like to kick it in and just shoot a, you know, 30-foot flame uh, out the back of the car. It'd be kind of wicked, kind of fun to do. Um, but anyway, it's cold out there, and it might get a lot colder. And uh, and then, you know what, it'll probably get warmer again. Um the climate is is in a state of flux, and the flux is much, much larger than human lifespans. And you can go on and on and on about how all the good things that ever happened during the um, 
humans on Earth happened during times of, of peak temperatures, you know, the warmest temperatures, when the Roman Empire existed, when the medieval warm period. All these things are times when the best things happen. It's the Ice Ages that we really should fear. And pretty soon, don't you worry, in a few years, once it becomes clear that's what's going to be happening, when we start getting into solar minimum, starts getting colder again, then uh, we'll start hearing about the evils of glo global cooling. And uh, I don't think that they're going to get the same leverage that they got. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I feel very, very different about um, about uh, Obama's position uh, since the Obamacare rollout. It's been so catastrophic. And as I said before, the reason that the Obamacare uh, rollout has been so damaging to him was because you can't spin the distance between um, an envelope and a citizen's eyeballs. You can have your media get out there and get in front of you on just about everything and have your movie stars and Lady Gaga and everybody else tell you that this is wonderful, it's just great, it's terrific, and oh, who wouldn't want free care, free health care, who wouldn't want that? But when you open your envelope and you find out that your insurance policy has been canceled or your rates have gone up by 70% or tripled or your deductibles tripled, there's nothing he can do about that. That's reality, and reality is... Um, is smacking them right in the right in the right in the face. All these guys, and I think um, you know, 38 percent approval t today for Barack Obama. Uh, that's an alarming. Um, that's an alarming number for a man with uh, three years left in his presidency to be at 38 percent with three years to go. Uh, I don't know what he's going to do to pull those numbers up. He's going to kill Bin Laden again. That's probably it. We're going to launch an international, uh, highly, highly secretive and, and, and top secret uh, deal where U.S. Navy SEALs will uh, will uh, exit the bottom of a submarine at the depths of the ocean and clad in the latest form of uh, extremely sophisticated, classified, deep, deep, deep sea diving gear. They'll be able to recover the body of uh, Osama bin Laden, bring it back up to the surface, prop him up against a wall someplace, and they'll shoot him again. Uh, and that'll get uh, that'll get the president's numbers back up. Uh, but other than that, I don't know what he's going to do. And I think once people start seeing him as a liar, then everything starts to get a little more interesting. And I even see signs, distant signs, that the press is actually starting to do its job. And uh, if the press starts doing its job, if if the American people realize this guy's been lying to us and they don't, they just see through the aegis of... Um, you know, the mainstream media's protection of this guy from start to finish. If they start asking questions, then um, then God only knows what might happen. Yeah. I'm working on a firewall right now about uh, about this, and the, what the title is, it's right in front of me. Pathological liar or criminally incompetent? Because he's going to be one of those two things. Hey, you guys, one of the advantages of being straddle -unders get the inside skinny on everything so uh yeah the whole the whole opening of the thing is basically saying that reality confines you sometimes i'll give you an example i like just cheat it out to you fine people um it's uh what do i have here yeah yeah you can tell me what you think you get a preview this will be the firewall i'm going to shoot tomorrow bring the firewall brand back would it be nice uh hi everybody welcome to the firewall i'm bill whittle you know, a lot of people, reasonably enough, have a love-hate relationship with reality. For example, if I stood here and told you that last night I flew to Venus in a spaceship made out of plywood, duct tape, and a lawnmower engine, I'll bring this around so the sight lines are better, and that the proof of me having been there and back in a few hours is this rock that I picked up on the surface, well, reality, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, confines, reality confines me into one of two different boxes. Either I'm lying or I'm crazy. Now, I can be both, but I have to be at least one. And by the way, for those of you out there thinking, well, someone would have to prove that you didn't go, or we won't know for sure until we test the rock, then look, that's uh, probably best to just face it. Uh, you know, maybe you and reality are just not right for each other. Frankly, you might as well leave now because this video is probably just going to tick you off because, you know, reality and I, we weren't even on speaking terms for a while, but uh, we're dating now. Uh, and uh, so that's the opening. And then we get into, um, you know, these cases. He said uh, he didn't know anything about Reverend Wright. He was in that church for 20 years. Are you too stupid to pick up the anti-Americanism? Are you lying? He said, um, oh, 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 uh, I didn't, uh, we, we didn't tell the president that we're going to have the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Manhattan. We just sprang it on him. We didn't give him any warning or anything. Really? Really? You didn't tell the president of the United States, Mr. Attorney General, that, uh, that, uh, 
you're going to try Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Manhattan? You just kind of broke it to him? Yeah. Your president is either lying, lying or he's incompetent. And if you did that without telling him after the big giant kerfluffle, certainly you were fired for it, right? No? What about Fast and Furious? Uh, you're selling guns? You're, not, you're running guns to Mexico? Hundreds of guns? Thousands of guns? You're going to give them to the cartels? And uh, the attorney general knows about it and is suppressing the whistleblowers and covering up, but the president didn't know you just decided to do this on your own, uh, Mr. Holder? That's the story from the Obama administration. So if Barack Obama is just merely incompetent and doesn't know what his own Department of Justice is doing on something that big, then surely he would have fired the man who, um, who launched this debacle, both the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed trial and Fast and Furious. That guy'd be fired twice, right? Nope, still there. Well, why wouldn't you fire him if you didn't know about it in advance, as you claim, Mr. Obama? If, he, if, if, this, if this guy took this action without letting you know about it, this catastrophic action in both cases, and didn't tell you, why isn't he fired? Or is it the other alternative? Uh, let's see, what else do we have on the lovely wish list? Uh, Benghazi. Yeah, Benghazi went out for 10 days. 10 days and said that this was the result of a movie that had been made months ago. Obscure movie. And don't worry, we put the filmmaker in jail for exercising his First Amendment rights because the future does not belong to those who insult the prophet of Islam. Uh, glad to know that the president um, puts those who insult the prophet of Islam in a... Uh, case, you know, behind the First Amendment that he swore an oath to defend. Uh, so he went out there and said, no, 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 no. It wasn't a coordinated attack. It was the result of a movie. So either the president of the United States did not know for 10 days what his chief of staff, secretary of state, national security advisors knew within 10, 15 minutes. Either the president was not aware of that for 10 days, which is criminal, impeachable negligence, or he's lying. The IRS, let's see, the Internal Revenue Service has been um, has been auditing conservative groups, but not liberal groups. Been doing it for quite a long time. The entire bureaucracy of the government, not just one or two cases, the entire bureaucracy, basically is uh, is skewed to uh, to attack and to uh, weaponize the IRS to go after conservative groups, but not liberal ones. And they just did this on their own. The president didn't know anything about it. Just listened to him. He said, "I only found out about it when I read the papers." Is that why the um, is that why you fired the um, the head of the Internal Revenue Service, the second you read the news report, you said, is this true? She said, yes, you fired her on the spot, right? No, why not? Why not? If you're so incompetent, you don't know your IRS is weaponizing itself against half of the American people, and you found out that it did happen, you would fire the person, right? But you didn't. So maybe you're lying. The National Security uh, 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 Agency is collecting billions of emails and transactions, cell phone calls, texts every single day. The Fourth Amendment says that each one of those has to be accompanied by an oath or affirmation. That's a lot of oaths and affirmations, don't you think? A lot of oaths and affirmations. Mr. President, you claim you didn't know anything about it until you read it in the newspaper. So your National Security Agency, of which you're the, of the government of which you're the chief executives, has been violating the Fourth Amendment billions of times every single day, and you didn't know about it? Really? Who did? Why didn't you know about it? How, how come somebody else had to find out? And how come you didn't know about it until you read it in the papers? Okay. Either that or you're lying. And you said you could, like your health plan, you could keep your health plan. You didn't put an asterisk there. You said period. You said period. Now that one, did you not know? Did you, or did you just listen to the people that told you wanted to hear? Or as the chief executive of a company, you're making an advertising claim. You're claiming... You're claiming something for this service, and you either have to deliver on it or you have to recant and you have to apologize and hope you don't go to jail for fraud. But So you either, either you didn't know when you should have known, or you're lying. And what about the uncle, you know, this uncle that you live with? I never lived with this man. I've never met the man. Really? Well, okay, we met him. Some staffer, apparently. Apparently, some staffer did some research and couldn't find any evidence of Obama living with his uncle, so they issued a statement saying that he never lived with his uncle, but that wasn't really Obama speaking. He's, he's either lying or he's incompetent. Those are your choices. You have one or the other. He can be both. And I think I'm going to close with this thing saying, I know a lot of you think he can't be incompetent because Barack Obama is the smartest man who ever lived in the White House. So how can he possibly be incompetent? He went to Harvard. Well... The stupidest man who ever lived in the White House, George Bush, he went to Harvard, too. You know what else? He went to Yale. He went to Harvard and Yale. Does that mean he's twice as smart as Barack Obama? 
Well, he was a C student. Yes, he was. What kind of what kind of grades did Barack Obama get? We don't know because they're locked up. Why would you lock up the uh, the academic records of a straight A student? He's the only. He was president of Harvard Law School. Yeah, but he was the only president of Harvard Law School who never wrote a law review. President of Harvard Law Review never wrote a law review. Did you find that a little odd? Why is that? If he's the smartest guy in the world, why, why, you'd, you'd be trotting those things out. They'd be getting gold stars. You'd, you'd think that the Harvard Law Review would put every single law review that Barack Obama ever wrote up on the fridge in the uh, break room in the lounge with a gold star attached. So how come we don't have those records? Or has it got anything to do with his biography where he claims he was born in Kenya? I'm not saying he was born in Kenya. I am saying he wanted you to think that. What is it about this guy that's so shady? Why can't he tell the truth about anything? What is going on here? What else is he lying about? Hard to say. Hard to say. Uh, I'll go with everything. That would be my vote. But um, anyway, yeah, I think that'll probably do it for our uh, opening rant today. I've got some uh, good news, by the way. Uh, excuse me one second. I'll take a little sip of water from my, uh, my new mug. Oh, look at that. Isn't that nice? I'm drinking a mug with my picture on it. Oops, sorry, I spilled a little. I spilled a little on my on my uh, on my new T-shirt. Sorry about that. Uh, those of you who are um, subscribers to BillWhittle.com, bless you for keeping the lights on here. And uh, if you are one of the um, subscribing members to BillWhittle.com, I'd like to apologize sincerely. Now, now, past all the snark here, I'd like to sincerely apologize for the lateness in getting you your goodies. We changed from uh, smart conservative thinking to common sense resistance for our tagline, and um, it, it it took us a long time to get this stuff out. But the but the uh, member merchandise has shipped, with the exception of the DVD, which we're still waiting is two months late from the compositor. It's a Hollywood person. There's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands. That doesn't absolve me of the responsibility. Uh, but it is, it's, we got the last two coming back from now. We'll get that DVD out as soon as possible. But those of you who, um, who did, uh, who did, uh, subscribe and, and are been patient as can possibly be for your, um, merchandise, it's on its way. And if you want some of this groovy merchandise, you can go to billwittle.com and click on the subscribe button. I can't tell you how important that is. Um, 2014 is going to be a very, very important year. Um, it's, uh, somebody said never got the shirt that they paid for at the end of October. I can assure you, uh, Connor, I mean this sincerely. I just talked to the person responsible for it. Uh, it is in the mail. They're on their way, all of them. We just got the fleeces back. They look really cool. Uh, so they are on their way. And again, uh, sincere apologies on my part. is extremely embarrassing and completely un, uh, unexpected. When we were told we could change the tagline, we thought it would be a week late. It turned out it was five weeks late. So uh, anyway, I'm wearing them now to show you that we've got them and we've uh, had the test for a while. They look terrific. They really are great. And they're on their way. Uh, so, yes. So Connor's saying, what happened to my shirt? It's on its way, I assure you. And uh, and again, many apologies and sincere uh, thanks for the uh, for the patience on your part. Uh, and Dave Olson says from the comments before we get into the um, to the prepared questions, what about the Arroyo? Well, as it turns out, they're going to be doing the screening of the Arroyo in um in uh, January, middle of January, so it's done. It's finished. It's going out to the DVD mastering. They're gonna, they're gonna get the DVDs, and then that's gonna go out to all of you who were members of Declaration Entertainment. And uh, I don't mean to uh, completely lock down the show uh, to subscribers and stuff, but I would like to say one thing to uh, Declaration members: uh, if you, we're we're about to send out an email now that the stuff is shipping and stuff to make sure that uh, everybody. Um, that everybody who was a member of Declaration has either gotten their money back or been transferred over to BillWhittle.com. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. And if you were once a member of Declaration and decided that, you know, it wasn't getting updated enough or whatever the case may be, the one thing I have been doing very, very hard and uh, concentrating on more than anything really for the last six weeks now is just shoveling coal into um, into the content machine and trying to update that that website every day, including weekends. I've missed one or two days. I've done a couple posts a day on some of the mothers and uh, some of the others. And so I just um, I just want uh, you guys to know that the one thing that uh, I personally have been working the hardest on is to make sure that uh, that I can, um, you know, look everybody in the eye and say you're getting as much content as I know how to deliver. I just work in every day to get something out there. I was very, very happy with Shards. Uh, I'll be doing more written commentary. I'm going to bring Firewall back, as I said, with this thing. Um, so... Uh, 
and and firewall is going to be a little more lighthearted. Give it a whole new look. By the way, we're going to change the the dress and and buff up the graphics a little bit too. So uh, yeah, and I think this week, um, as we said in our newsletter that goes out, uh, we're going to be uh, doing the first installment of um, Big Bat Problems. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. A couple people want to know where we are with the CSR membership numbers, and we're about a quarter of the way. Uh, about a quarter of a way, something like that, uh, of what we needed to get to the common sense resistance thing. So it's looking like January, um, end of January, maybe February, before we can get to that point. Uh, I expect to do a, a fairly big um, push in the beginning of January. This is the last thing I'll say about the subscribers. We'll get on to the questions here. Um, I think I think that this year, 2014, you know, I always talk in, in military terms, and for years I was saying we're going to whip these guys out of their boots. It turns out that, you know, the guy got reelected. But what we need right now politically is um, is we need cavalry right now. Right now is when we need cavalry. These people are disoriented. They're demoralized, uh, and they're and they're in a panic. And this is the time not to just stand there on the line and just hold the line. Now's the time to get the cavalry, draw your sabers, get into the rear, and run them into the river. Run them into the river. Um, that's what we want to do. We want to run them into the river. So uh, 2014 is going to be a year to do that, not only politically, but uh, in terms of the messaging. The wheels are coming off this guy. He's in real trouble. We can not only we, we can't unelect Barack Obama. He's going to he's he's going to barring you know the press deciding to do their job someday. He's going to finish out his term. So what do we get out of this eight years of ruin? If we have a cavalry. If we had a mobile force that could pursue them while they're in retreat, then what we would get out of the eight years we paid for is we might get two decades of never having to hear this progressive crap again. We might have we might have the opportunity to discredit these people to such a degree that no one votes for them again in living memory. You have to wait a whole new generation or two of people before you get that stupid again. So um, we're going to have to get them and run them into the river, and we need the resources to do that. So if you can be a part of this uh, army, it would really help. I know there's some players out there that are doing tremendous, tremendous good, uh, and they've got they've got big um, big money behind them. And we just need relatively small amount of cash to do an awful lot of great work, including the common sense resistance, which is going to happen in 2014. And as soon as we get that 510 members we need, we're about a quarter of the way. Um, I'll announce the common sense resistance by doing the first video. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think what I'll probably do is I think I'll do my next essay on the common sense resistance. Uh, because I talked about it in a bunch of stratosphere lounges and a couple of blog posts, but I think I'll do one about it just in terms of what I expect it to do, and I'll probably intercut it with dialogue from it, you know, uh, the kind of things that, you know, where you can see it, it'd, it'd read like a like a bit like a novel where you, you, you wouldn't see the video because we haven't shot it yet, uh, but you would be able to see from the, the description, it'd be a written essay, what... Um, what this thing is going to look like, what it's going to sound like, how people are going to talk, what the locations are going to be and look like and all that other stuff, how we're going to get the message out there. So, uh, yeah, so we'll do that. And once we get this thing up and going, then we'll have the means to do a whole new line of merchandise for Common Sense Resistance and everything could be really, really fun and important. So um, that's that. Uh, let's get into the questions for the day for Episode 51. or on our second, uh, second hundred. So... Um, yeah, let's get, you know, the common sense resistance is really designed for young people. It's designed for young people, and the whole purpose of it is, uh, I know I just jumped back onto it, but I just had to say this. That's for young people, and it's designed to do one thing. It's designed to show them that people are willing to live in the sewers and eat rats on spits being roasted over burning tires because they rip out their chip that gives them government housing and government food and government transport and government health care. Why would they do that? Why would they go to the trouble of being so miserable and so uncomfortable and living a life of such hardship? What's so valuable? And the answer is freedom and honor and, uh, and uh, motive. Uh, and so when you see somebody willingly tear one of these chips out of their arms, which is painful, and there is no anesthetics to, to spare for them, and you see 15, 16, 17-year-old actors basically playing people who've decided to go off the grid, get out of the, um, get out of the, the, the government dole, and, and go out and live on their own and be free and independent. When you see them undergoing the kind of hardships that they undergo, living in the you know in the rubble basically, like the uh, like the human resistance in the Terminator movies, 
then you don't even have to say anything, right? You don't even have to hit them with a with a philosophical speech because you can tell from the drama of somebody having this going through them and the fact that they're shivering in the cold and hanging out with their with their with their uh, their buddies and their and their and their pals, um, their band of brothers, that they're doing it for something worth dying for. And if the soft, cozy masses in their government uh, housing projects with their government uh, algae cakes are not willing to do it, and you are, then just the act of doing it is the strongest possible statement that you can possibly make, right? That's, just, that's what the common sense resistance is all about. We're going to give up the free handout because there's something more important. And the thing you really have to show is you, you have to show that even though the people who are in the common sense resistance, who go off the grid, who, who decide to live this rebel life, you have to show that even though their life is far more hard, it's, it's filled with hardships. They're hungrier and they're colder and they don't have a nice place to sleep or and they don't have any security. But their life is better because if it wasn't better, they wouldn't do it, right? There's something. They get something out of it. They get something out of it. They get the joy of being free. They get the pride of ownership. They get the pride of, of, uh, of individuality and, and accomplishment and all that stuff. So... Um, so you can see how the whole thing is set up so that you don't really have to give them a message at all. But I did talk to some makeup guys, and I'm going to um, – I'll probably do the first one or two, uh, and I'll do it as a CSR actual, uh, which is a temporary position. It's kind of like first speaker. Uh, you know, CSR actual would be the guy who, who at the moment has the votes to be the speaker of the Common Sense Resistance, but there is no leadership because we talked about the network structure, and I'll put all that into the video and how the wrenches work and – and how engineers work in the wrench and all that other stuff. But um, so I'll get into all that. But I'll intercut it with like scenes, like you know, with actual s fiction scenes from the um, from the world, and put some of the chrome in that. And I think it'll be the next written commentary I do, and hopefully um, we can get the word out and uh, get more people to sign up. And the sooner we get those numbers, the sooner we'll be able to do it. And once we do it, I think it'll just do itself. I just be, uh, I think it'll just take on a life of its own and. Um, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But we'll still have fun. It'll be a fun way to get the message out to to you know to kids. Give them uh, you're you're giving them a video game and you're giving them um, webisodes and it's drama. It's not a lecture. They don't seem to be willing to listen to lectures much. I guess I don't know if I was willing to listen to them much myself at that age. Um, anyway, here we go with the questions for episode fifty one. Uh, Ilias Ben Medjub would be my guess. Ilias. Or Elias Ben Medjub, apologies if I got your name wrong, uh, wants to know, how many liberals could you take in a fist fight? <sighs> how many you got? Uh, uh, yeah, how many you got? They don't seem to be too willing to get into fist fights, and I'm not either, actually. I'm not a fist fighting kind of guy too much, but I think I could probably take 30 or 40 of them. Um, because I think really uh, what you... What you really are talking about here is um, how many people are willing to, to fight for what they believe in. And uh, I don't know. It's funny, you know, it's really, it's just what I'm about to say, all this stuff just kind of flies in my, um, into my head on the uh, spur of the moment. But on some level, I think I'd probably be more willing to shoot somebody than fight them. In other words, I don't need to get into fistfights over my politics and, you know, I have an opinion and so on. It's only you really know you're serious when the world is coming down and you really are prepared to, you know, I mean, if this country economy collapses and you've got, you know, warring tribes, I've got an AR-15, I don't have it for decoration purposes, you know, I mean, it really comes down to uh, if, 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 you, if you lose civilization, basically, if the structure of civilization goes away, I think you're going to be left with three classes of people. You're going to be left with the anarchists and the looters and the, and the predators. You're going to be left with the, the big um, inert middle who doesn't know what to do. Uh, who will follow whoever is, you know, armed in front of them, whoever whoever's pr whoever is influencing the most force. And you're going to hopefully have a group of people who are law and order types like me, you know, you know ex-policemen, ex-military, all the sheepdogs are going to say, hey, you know, uh, we got to we got to get this thing together. We got to get this thing lined up. It's another reason I like the common sense resistance. I, I think it would be, at this point in history, not a bad idea to have a real world network of people who felt like they could fix things and who were sheepdogs. Um, I think that network would be a very valuable thing to have in place and be nothing make me nothing but happy 
to find out that it wasn't needed after all, and the whole thing was just a giant um, skin for political commentary because I can see a world where something like that could actually be important. Um, so not too many fistfights, um, Elias. Uh, if the question meant how many liberals could I take in a firefight, I think the answer would probably be not how many you got, but I think the answer would be all of them because um, they don't seem to have any not only any interest in being in a firefight or being any good in a firefight, they, they, they have a, a, a superstitious fear of weapons. Freud said something about that, the fear of weapons is a sign of an immature mind. Um, the, uh, I don't know if you've ever been around actual real liberals or progressives when there's a firearm uh, in their presence, but they really, they like run from the room, honestly. They just don't want to be, they want to be in the same room at it, don't want to look at it. They've given it um, magical powers. Their worldview has had to uh, blame somebody for this violence. It can't be violence in the human heart, because if there was violence in the heart of the individual and uh, and people made a choice to do bad things, then you'd want a government that protected you against them stealing power, and you'd want to hold them personally responsible in the event that they committed a heinous crime. So it can't be that. Um, so there has to be some reason why these horrible murders are happening, and since it can't be that there are criminals, it has to be because of the guns. So fear the gun and run away before it uh, casts its evil metallic spell over you and you probably should cross yourself in, in, in well you can't cross yourself in their presence because that's Christian but you could probably make some sort of um, you know inverted pentagram or something that they could all agree on um, so yeah I think uh, I think you could probably take all of them in a firefight interesting question um, John Swetland says is the collapse of Obamacare the beginning of a paradigm shift where the young voters are finally understanding the consequences of the cool vote. Yes, it is, John. I couldn't agree more, as I said earlier. Once people start seeing the results of this, what I said at the election, at this uh, 2012 election after we lost, I said, you know, the American people keep voting um, for socialism, and now it's time to give them what they voted for, because they voted for socialism in a capitalist world, and they don't know any better. They don't know that um, these are the consequences. And so they're getting the consequences. Look, if you didn't give this much thought, and I didn't give politics much thought for most of my life. I went right up into my 40s, early 40s, without giving it a second thought. Not, yeah, he seems like a nice guy. I'll vote for him. Yeah, he's got a good-looking tie on. I'll vote for him. Never gave it a second thought. So if they're talking about free health care, you think, who, who'd be against free health care? I didn't think about what health care costs. I didn't know anything about um, about pricing structures, didn't know anything about government interference in the market, but didn't know anything about that. So if somebody's up there saying, hey, man, it's free health care, and the press is going, yeah, it's free health care, how would you know any differently? This is one thing um, that uh, I'm going to be on um, in terms of messaging uh, in the year coming up. And it's a hard thing for me because, frankly, like most of you, I, I kind of want to rub people's noses in it. If you voted for Obama twice, I kind of want to make you pay. That's the short form of it. But that doesn't pay. That's not a smart strategy, and I'd rather win than feel good. And so uh, my messaging position is going to be, uh, Charles, is that, I'm sorry, uh, John, is that um, if you voted for this guy twice and you're just now waking up, then I don't blame you. You had no other way of knowing. The press was supposed to have told you about this stuff back in 2008, and they didn't. Now you're finding out for yourself. And you're finding out that those of us who criticized this health care plan, maybe we're not racist, maybe there's something wrong with it. And maybe if you listen to what we actually said, we've been saying the whole time, the, the law stinks, the plan stinks, uh, government intrusion in your life stinks, and it's all about the spending. And we weren't saying a damn thing about the guy's race, other than to say it's a shame that the first black president turned out to be this guy. Would have been nice if it was a patriot. You know, would have been nice if it was Alan West or somebody like that. That would have been better. Uh, Bill, Sh Bill Schlitz on um, Red Eye said something in January of 2009 of Barack Obama had been president for three weeks or something, and I heard this comment from him. Uh, this before I ever did the show. Bill Schlitz said, uh, him being black is the only thing I like about him. I said, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so I think the thing that's going to be hard for us if the wheels continue to come off like this, and I think they're going to, uh, the hard part for me, and I would encourage you to take the same tact, although it's certainly your decision, would be to say, instead of rubbing people's noses in it, uh, why don't we just rub the press's noses in it? Because they're really where the problem is. You know, hey, it's not your fault. You, you know, 
Did you know about this? Yeah. How'd you find out? No, I've just been doing a lot of reading and stuff. Had to go looking for it because God knows you're not going to read about it in the New York Times. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, but yes, I completely agree. Uh, Obamacare is killing them because people have to pay and people have to actually pay. And the, 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 if you had to put a, if you had to put a fulcrum point or something where a mile marker where the thing really did turn, if it turns out that it does in fact mean the end of this guy and the end of his politics, the end of progressivism for a while until, you know, another three decades of prosperity go by and then you have to go out and mow the lawn again. Um, but if it turns out that's the case, I think the I think I'd put the mile marker right here, right after the Obamacare website came out. A woman uh, went to sign up, and she was one of the few people who got through and had a lot of trouble getting through. And she went to sign up, and she found out that her rates were going to go up significantly. And then, um, and then she said, uh, "Well, I voted for Obamacare when I thought it was going to be free, but I didn't know it was going to cost me more." That's where I'd put the milestone for the Barack Obama presidency and for liberalism and progressivism if, in fact, we can roll down this tide because if we can get some cavalry in there, and for me that means if we can get some members up there, the more resources we have, the more we can do, the more we can spread the message, um, then uh, I think that's the point. I think that's the point when people realized you promised me my rates would be lower and that I could keep my plan. My rates are higher and I can't keep my plan. That's when people are going to realize, oh, so it's not free? No, you have to pay more so that other people don't have to pay anything. Well, what now? Yeah, huh? how about that? This is something I've talked about a lot, and you've seen me do this in a bunch of speeches. Everybody's all about wealth redistribution as long as it's somebody else's money being redistributed to you. When it's time to redistribute your money to people who are poorer than you, and there are always people poorer than you, and if you live in America, then 93% of the world is poorer than you, uh, no matter where you are in America then all of a sudden wealth redistribution doesn't seem like such a good idea and we need to be pointing this out every opportunity so that's that dave olson asks uh, everyone remembers the best christmas gift they got what's the best christmas give you gift you ever gave i obviously copy and pasted this and i've been given a little bit of thought and that's a toughie um I gave a kid a telescope once, and we went out and looked at Saturn and Jupiter, and you get that really nice, uh, ooh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, I think the nicest gift I ever gave, I probably gave uh, a few nights ago. Um, I have a friend who's got a son who's uh, in soccer, and I did that, um, I did that uh, afterburner about that, um, about uh, about how, how well he played and... Um, Silent Saturday afterburner, and how I was, you know, a little league kid and stuff, and and this is a sweet kid, he's a really good kid, um, but he's growing up in a very tough time, and it's tough for a single mom. It's very very tough to be the person who enforces discipline as well as um, as well as nurturing that boy, and, and you know, and loving him, and make sure he's dressed and fed and everything. It's very very high, hard to um, to make sure they're fed and loved and nurtured, and and at the same time crack the the discipline whip. And um, anyway, um, this uh, kid, uh, really good kid, uh, made uh, the all-star team for his soccer league. And so I took them uh, out for dinner, uh, and uh, nice place, and um, just got there in the restaurant and asked when we when I booked the reservation if, I had, uh, if there was any special event. I said, yeah, it's a little celebration of somebody, somebody who made the soccer team. So... Um, so we got to this restaurant and we got in our little booth and uh, and the waitress came by and she had a little bag and she started sprinkling these things on the table and they were little shiny little things in different colors, metallic things in red and green and gold and blue and stuff. And it said, uh, congratulations on it. And she sprinkled them all over the table and this, uh, and this boy looked up at me and said, what, what, what are these for? I said, well, what do you think they're for? And he just kind of lit up. Um, he, I don't think he fully realized that, yeah, this is this is all about you, pal. And so um, we drank a toast to his hard work because he worked very, very hard on this. Uh, and I'm trying to help um, his mom with uh, with providing not just a stick but the carrot too. Um, you know, I'm trying to make it clear to this boy 
how the world works, or at least how the world should work, and that, that there should be rewards for good behavior and, and punishment for bad behavior. It's how, it's how we become civilized. This idea that children are these perfect little ethical beings is absolute utter nonsense. They're, Bill Cosby on this better than anybody. They're just a bunch of lying little tyrants. They'll, they'll have their faces smeared with chocolate uh, icing, and they'll swear that no, they have no idea who, who ate the chocolate cake. So you have to teach them how to be adults, and you have to teach boys how to be men. So I think maybe the best Christmas present I ever gave, I gave on Saturday night, because after after we said congratulations uh, and stuff, I um, I said, I've got, a, I've got a, a present for you to celebrate this. And he lit up at that. I said, it's an adult present, and it comes with an adult set of uh, strings attached. There are conditions attached to this present, just like everything else in the adult world. Nothing's really easy. It seems there's always some kind of... Some kind of a string attached one way or another, but uh, it's an adult present, and I'll give it to you if you'd like, understanding that there are strings attached, and I'll give it to you first, then I'll tell you what the strings are. And he said, okay. So I reached into my um, reached into my jacket pocket, and I pulled a little white envelope out, and it was a tiny little envelope. And he, um, he uh, opened it up, and inside was a black card, looked like a credit card, and he turned it around, and the letters in gold on the front said, um, said the name of a sports person. Uh, sporting goods store, soccer supply store here in town, which is where he shops and lives and saves his money just to go down there so he can buy more more soccer gear and jerseys and all sort of stuff. He saw that thing on the front of the card and he just lit up. He just illuminated the room. He was so happy. And I said, uh, all right, here's the deal. Uh, here's the deal. Um, there's $200 on that card. And he went into orbit again, you know. I said, it's $200 on that card and um, let me explain to you the strings attached here, because there's bad news and good news. I'll give you the bad news first. The bad news is, you may thought that I just gave you $200 of stuff at this sporting goods store, but I didn't. I gave you the opportunity to go buy $200 of stuff at the sporting goods store, because if it turns out that your mom thinks that you're misbehaving, or that you're not doing your homework, or that you're talking back, or any of these other things, you know, then then you don't get the card, and she can hold it as long as she wants to, and if she wants to cut it in half, she can cut it in half. It's your, it's your opportunity, but she controls it based on your behavior. So that's the bad news. Do we understand that? That it's not yours until she says it's yours and that she has the right to withhold this if you, if you don't do the things you're supposed to do? And he said, yeah. I said, well, then congratulations, young man. You worked very, very hard for that, and I worked very hard for the $200 to put on that card. So that's, that's just to celebrate you making the All-Star team. Now, here's the good news. Um, the good news is, that um, we can uh, we can get um, can turn this into a credit card. In other words, the money that's on that card already is uh, is is your reward for having worked as hard as you did all season long and all the practice that you did. And you worked a lot harder than the other kids. I was there. I, I, I ran drills with you. Um, so that's a reward for that, and that's done. But if it turns out that you um, that you do more of the stuff that we want to see. If, you're, if your grades are better and, and your behavior is better and, and you're doing jobs around the house, doing your homework doesn't count as more. That's what you're expected to do. But if you do stuff above and beyond what you're expected to do, I'll just keep putting money on that card. I mean, we'll just, we'll just look at it as a credit card. You work for what you need to do and you'll get the rewards on the card. I'll work to put that on the card. So that's how it works. If you misbehave, you don't get automatically the stuff you have the opportunity to get the stuff you behave yourself but if you do above and beyond the call of duty and you do more than's expected of you and if you can think of ways to do more than's expected of you not only will i keep putting money on that card but then we can start talking about things like going to see games you know in in the city around the country around the world even we can talk about coaches and tutors and all that stuff and uh he was as happy as could be and his mom was as happy as could be and i was as happy as could be and uh and I really just, I don't know, I liked it. I liked the way it felt. I liked, I liked the whole thing. I thought it was really handled well, and, um, and I could tell from the reaction that it was, uh, that was just somebody just said in the comment section with a bit of lag here, it was a gift to me seeing um, the way that he, that he lit up at that. Not just at the, at the loot, although it's nice to get the loot, especially when it's the one thing you're just cr crazy obsessed, passionate about. Uh, but it's also nice, I think, one of the things that really struck me about his reaction was uh, I think he really understood that he was being treated as an adult in this area anyway um, and had an opportunity to do something um, 
bigger than what he's used to. And sure enough, you know, the next day, it uh, turned out he was acting up a little bit, and mom threatened the card, and whoop, that solved that problem right away. Whoop, back in, back into, uh, back into behavior. And you know, the, the only reason I bring it up is because I hadn't. I, I genuinely swear to you, uh, Dave, I did not know the answer to that question until I started talking about it. Because I was thinking of things that I gave people five, ten, fifteen years ago. It happens Saturday. Um, but it is the best present I ever gave anybody. And it was the best present I could give to that kid. It was a great present to me. It was a great present to, to his mom, too. It meant a lot to her. And, um, and that seems to me to be the one thing that kids aren't getting these days. They're not getting, they're not getting the sense of, uh, of calmness, and they're not getting the sense of, um, of how things work. Uh, uh, you can't expect people to turn away entitlements if they've never had this kind of background. If everybody gets everything they want all the time, how are you going to how are you going to wean people from an entitlement mentality? You know, so many of these people today, so many of these kids. I know. I, I don't want to sound hard on the millennials, as I said, I think last show. Um, th- these millennials don't. It's not their fault that everybody's given them everything, and, and I'm sure it doesn't feel like they've been given everything to them either. But the fact is, they have been. I think they've been overprotected and over, and I think they've been bought by parents who don't want to. Fe- feel bad about, you know, having discipline with them because of what happened with their parents, with, with my generation's parents. And so I think, that, you know, if we don't make the case that, yes, um, there are some things that you, that you do that you get a reward for, and then if you want more, you have to do more. And that's basically it, right? You, you, you tie the, re- the reward in with the work. And so you, you say, if you behave like a jackass. We're going to take away some of these things that you already assume are yours because they're not yours. You just have the opportunity. But if you do more of the good stuff, then um, you get more. And I made it clear to him, too, that this money that I put on the card doesn't just come out of the trees. You know, I have to work very hard for that money. I'm up every single night till 10 o'clock. I got to get these essays up. I got to get new segments up. I got to write trifectas and afterburners. I got to I got to work my butt off for this. Um, so it's not like I just snap my fingers and it's there. And he understands that. And he's a good kid. And he'll do well. And uh, I think it's going to be the best present I ever got anybody. And we're going to find out. I think uh, he's going to play on uh, the 21st. I think he's going on his first road game. His new coach is really tough, too. The coach he had was a really good guy, really, really good man, and I really liked him. But because he was a coach of just general kids, you know, was everything was kind of, hey, good shot, Josh. Hey, way to go, Aaron. Way to go. This new coach, the all-star coaches. Where'd you pass that ball to? I don't see anybody standing. Did you just pass it to the field? Did you just pass it to that piece of grass? What's the matter with you? Pass the ball where there's somebody else. Don't pass it. It's like he's not used to getting that kind of treatment. But um, but it's good for him, and it's good for him to get yelled at because he can he he like many again many people of this generation who've been so emotionally protected. He's probably never been really yelled at by somebody before based on his performance, and he's he's going to have to learn how to how to separate. He's going to have to learn how not to take it personally. He's going to have to learn how a criticism of his of his playing is not a reflection on him being a bad person. And that's something that, again, we're seeing you know uh, uh, epidemics of with these millennials, where if you criticize their work, they they simply have not hadn't been criticized much because they're precious snowflakes, and uh, and so they they take it very very personally, like you hate them and there's something wrong with them. It's like well, I don't hate you. I don't think there's anything wrong with you. I just don't think you're doing this right. So let's buck it up, Bucky. Um, anyway, that was a great question, Dave. Thanks very much. And, uh, thanks for all your repeated comments for all of you out there who who are, uh, regulars on the Facebook page. I, uh, really appreciate all the kind words. Speaking of regulars, we're moving down on the team and show here. I don't know if it's brothers or family or aliases or what, but it seems like three or four team teaming up at any, that's where the name comes from, uh, at any moment to, um, to dominate, dominate the, uh, questions segment. They're very good questions. Why we pick them, they get the highest rating. Um, so moving on, um, uh, Zachariah, Ze- sorry, excuse me, Zechariah Demon says, with the rise of games like Bioshock Infinite, a game that challenges the idea of American exceptionalism, and Gone Home, a game where you do, don't do anything besides walking around a house trying to learn about a family's social struggles and the increasing popularity of feminist ridicule, is there any way to stop the left from taking over the medium? Wow, a bunch of questions in that one question. Uh, first of all, let's do the one where you don't do anything besides walking around a house trying to learn about a family's social su- struggles. Uh, gone Home. How's that game selling? I've never heard of it. 
I hope it's not selling well. It might be selling well enough, I guess. I mean, people play The Sims, and uh, I've never really understood The Sims. I love Sim City. Sim City is one of the greatest computer games ever made. In fact, I think you should not be able to hold public office in America. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. From the bottom of my heart, uh, I don't think you should be able to be elected to office in America unless you can make a SimCity city function for 300 terms. If you don't know how to keep a city in the black in SimCity, you you got some remedial learning to do. But games like The Sims, I don't know about the walking, uh, the Gone Home game. It doesn't seem like it's a big seller to me, uh, Zechariah. Um, Bioshock Infinite may say that challenges the idea of American exceptionalism, ex exceptionalism, except I'm assuming Bioshock is an American company, right? Is this another one of these cases where these people sitting on Apple computers, I got into arguments back in the day before we really got cooking around here. Uh, even before I started writing, I'd get into arguments with Chinese and Russians about how stupid Americans are and how awful we are and how ignorant we are and how fat and stupid and lazy. And, and the ultimate rejoinder to these people is finally the same. Interesting conversation we're having about American incompetence on Apple computers and Microsoft computers on, uh, on you know, uh, on uh, satellites that are that are put up by America and uh, apparently it's a very popular game um, and uh, so you know we're using uh, you know, American hard drives and American chips and it's like you know please guys honestly so I don't know if if, the, if uh, Bioshock is is really driving down um, uh, American exceptionalism I would say to the degree that it does you look at games like Medal of Honor or um, Battlefield or any of these other things. I mean, uh, these guys are, I mean, I know you can play different nationalities and I know they have international teams and all that other stuff, but the fact of the matter is, um, uh, and by the way, uh, enough people are saying um, that uh, Gone Home is worth looking into. I'll look into it. I, I, hadn't he I haven't heard it before this. I'll check it out. But in any event, um, I'm not sure that they can really take, uh, liberalize the medium because frankly, video games are based on violence and, and firepower as a general rule. I suppose if people want to, um, if people want to, you know, do things where they're looking into the family's um, social struggles, not to be a jerk about this, but isn't the entire point of video games is so that you don't have to walk around the house trying to figure out what's going on with the family's social struggles? That's the entire idea of video games, as far as I was concerned, was a chance to go into a room someplace, put on the headphones, and just lose yourself and get away from this uh, family's uh, social struggles. So... You know, I don't know. It probably seems to me like it might be a passing phase. What do I know? Maybe it's the harbinger of a whole new wave of self-indulgence where you play a video game to uh, enhance the experience of sitting around in your own family trying to figure out why everybody's yelling at everybody else. Um, but it doesn't seem to me like it's, you know, got legs. I mean, I don't know. Um, the uh, the big ones, you know, that just sweep in just seem to be stuff. Oh, gosh, what's the name of it? It was about a year ago. That game with the dragons came out as the the world that you get to walk in, and everybody gets sh shot in the leg with an arrow. What that name is? I'm gonna have, in in 25 seconds, there's gonna be 30 comments that are gonna tell me the name of that game. It was a big, huge game, but those things are the things that seem to make a really big splash. Um, so uh, uh, ever the, the the it's the name of the world. Um, Anyway, it'll, it'll come up in a second. So, you know, and finally, uh, this is a question, part of the question I like to hear a lot, the increasing popularity of feminist ridicule. How do, um, how do feminist ridicule increase beyond the level that they're at now? I mean, honestly, some things have to be asymptotic, right? I mean, you can't, um, I don't know how you, Skyrim, thank you, Viper. It's Skyrim. Uh, what's the game I was talking about that made such a huge splash? Um, yeah, here come, here they come, hundreds of them. Uh, you know, I don't care what feminists have to say about it. The, 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 if, if feminists ridicule a feminist, is there anything else they do? I, is there anything else they do? Um, except ridicule? I'm not aware of it. Oh, they, they launch assaults occasionally. I've seen uh, something, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, the feminists can just go pound sand, honestly. Seriously, the best way, if you really want to get at a feminist, really, the you know, I, I just like to figure out how you're going to really hurt somebody. If they decide to be a major jackass emotionally, you really want to just stick them with a shiv. The way you get at the Russians and the Chinese and the and the Germans who are telling you how stupid and fat we are and how, how um, irrelevant and, and, and banal our culture is, is to say, well, you say that about American uh, pop artists in, in American culture. Do you know? You want to know what Americans think about German culture? You want to know what Americans think about Russian culture? Yeah, what do you think? We don't. 
We don't think about it. It never crosses our mind. We don't have any idea who your movie stars are. We don't have any idea who your recording stars are. We don't care, neither does the rest of the world. We just don't give a damn, honestly. So whatever, you know, great. Uh, so that's that's lovely. And frankly, if I was if I had a real, you know, hardcore shrieking feminist, I think the shortest thing to do is to say, you know, isn't that? What a cute little opinion that is. Did you come up with that while you were doing the laundry? I don't know, get him a little pissed off. Lovely. Now go make me a sandwich. <clears throat> yeah, that drive them out of their mind. Uh, I don't actually believe that about women, by the way, just so you know, because I think I got a little feedback about that. Dames go, you know, broads go, go in the kitchen, make me a sandwich. Uh, I just think, um, I just think that's a good way to get people's goats. It's fun to get their goats sometimes to see where they, what really lights them up, because then they'll tell you what they really think. Um, so moving on, um, Mark O'Malley, there's a name, Mark O'Malley asks, Obama, based on his confessed past, would have been and still is ineligible to join the Marines as a private recruit, recruit or second Louis. How about a change in the law that says anyone running to be CNC has to be eligible to join the military? Faith and Begora, Mark O'Malley. Uh, a better argument, Mark, I actually can do a pretty decent Irish accent. I got to step back for the mic because if you're going to do Irish, you got to really put a lot of, you got to put a lot of. You gotta sing it, you know. You gotta kind of, kind of, kind of sing it out. It's gotta be like, well, how about it as a four octave kind of a thing? Um, I tell a joke in an Irish accent when I when I've had a beer or two. That's really remarkably good, I think. Um, I'm sure Mark O'Malley hasn't been Irish for five generations. Anyway, Mark, um, based on his confessed past, uh, Obama could not have joined the Marines. You're right. He couldn't be a private recruit, recruiter or a second lieutenant. And your question is, should anyone uh, running to be commander-in-chief or be president have to be eligible to join the military? I don't think I would go that route, but I would make, a, I would make something pretty clear, and this is really important. Um, what's important is Barack Obama could not get, could not get the lowest level of security uh, clearance. He couldn't get a secret clearance. He, he, he simply could not get one. He associates with terrorists like Bill Ayers and communists like Frank Marshall Davis and, and, and um, Van Jones and the rest of these guys. The president of the United States could not get the lowest level clearance. And I absolutely would be willing to pass a, a constitutional amendment that says that the president of the United States of America has to be able to get a top secret clearance prior to becoming a candidate. Top secret clearance, um, because he's going to have top secret information. And frankly, if the guy can't get a top secret clearance, if his if his background and his um, and his connections and his affiliations and his ability to blab things off the top of his lungs are so like me, for example, if that guy can't get a top secret clearance, then um, then you know he's got no business having access to top secret information. I mean, it's just self self evidence, self evident. It's shocking that the president of the United States couldn't get a, a secret, couldn't get the lowest level clearance, or whatever the lowest level clearance is, might be as confidential or something, or whatever it is. He couldn't get that. He couldn't get the lowest level clearance. Um, yeah, it's completely shocking, Mark, and it's another example of just how how badly messed up this guy is. And the thing, see, here's the thing I don't understand. I can understand Obama pushing for his candidacy and covering all the stuff up, and I can understand his handlers and his people and all the other pressure that they apply, guys like Rahm Emanuel and and Axelrod and all this other stuff. But I actually have a hard time understanding how, how come more military people and Secret Service agents have not come up and stood up and said, this is what the guy is. I know some people don't want to damage their career, but for God's sakes, we're talking about the country here. I mean, I damaged my Hollywood career irreduce, you know, ir irredeemably by backing George Bush. Um, there's something more important than your career. And um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why more people are just coming up and saying, you know, the guy can't get a clearance. He can't get, he, he can't know any of this stuff. His, his, I don't know. And there's a lot of things going on in the military that, that upper level uh, Pentagon brass agrees to. And I'm just shocked that they do. And then I, then I hear from people who really know what's going on, that there are, as with anything else in the world, any other profession in the world, you have different kinds of people. And there are political generals and there are wartime generals. And um, the wartime generals are the guys that keep the country free. And then the political generals go out there and they're like any other political animal. If, uh, if this is the fastest path to promotion and, you know, an extra star, they take it. Uh, I wish it wasn't true. And, uh, and I don't know 
how else to um, explain it. I mean, one example that just really shook me was I was reading a book, one of my favorite books called, um, um, uh, I think it was just called Boyd, about John Boyd, who's a real hero of mine, a real idol of mine. Uh, Boyd, the, the, the fighter pilot who changed the course of history, I think is the name of the, of the book. And it was talking about John Boyd and, and John Boyd's associates who were fighting the Pentagon brass and trying to get a fighter that would actually perform. I mean, we were, we were talking about the F-111 as, uh, as our premier fighter. The F-111 has a turning radius of a, you know, of, a, of, a, of the Nimitz. I mean, it's just, it's just this, it's a bus. It's a school bus, not a fighter. And, and they're, they're, um, they're fighting the Pentagon, who's insisting on all this stuff. But the, in, the, in the book, the great example, the one I just simply couldn't find a way to, I couldn't find a way to justify what the top-level military was doing. This would be back in the 80s, I guess. But, you know, they were talking about um, the M2, um, the uh, armored personnel carrier. And uh, and they were saying that uh, a bunch of um, a bunch of political generals who had been responsible for guiding this project were behind it, and and Boyd and one of his acolytes, uh, per, uh, Sperry maybe, um, was saying, um, no, this thing's a death trap. It's a death trap. And so they were putting the vehicle through its trials, and um, what they were doing is they were doing the tests. And one of the tests was to see how well it would take, like, an RPG attack or an RPG round. Or another test would be to see how it behaved when it got hit by a certain kind of artillery round. And what they were doing was the, the Pentagon generals were setting up the test where they'd take it out into the field, and they'd fill the gas tanks full of water. And they're saying, what? No, just fill them with full of water. Why? So it doesn't explode. Don't we want to know? Don't we want to know that it's going to explode? No, we don't want to know. It, we already know, and we don't want anybody else to know. And so you have generals who are basically saying, we're going to fill the tanks with water on this test. And other generals who, when they were testing it against RPG fire, found out little details, but you find out that like they were using like a Czech RPG or a, you know, or a, or a, some knockoff RPG that had like a third or a quarter of the total warhead penetrating power of the Russian RPGs that would be used against this thing. And this kind of cheating and this kind of like PR, uh, yeah, PR spray. Uh, and, uh, and so... You have guys with stars on their bar, uh, on their shoulders. You've got guys who are sworn to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. You've got soldiers who have made a career in the Army who are basically putting water in the tanks of an armored personnel carrier. They're going to carry their soldiers into combat, and they're, and they're faking these tests so that the Bradley doesn't look bad. And they're going to have their kids go out there, their soldiers, their, their same army troops are going to go out there and die in a defective vehicle so that they look good, so that they don't look bad. We're going to put water in the gas tanks. We're going to use weakened rounds for the testing. I, can't, I just I had a hard time crediting that that would be possible. That kind of treason, not just treason to the government or treason to the country, a treason to your comrades, a treason to your brothers in arms. I mean, my God. You you find these kind of things just just say it just can't be possible. And then you realize no people are people. There are bad people in every line of work. And these political generals, look, no one's ever put it this way to them, right? No one's ever said to them what I'm just saying. You're going to send American soldiers out there to die, to cover your ass so that you don't look bad. You should. Do you have a ceremonial sword that you can fall on? Just you know honestly. If I was president of the United States and I was commander-in-chief, I found out any one of these cases, I'd actually launch an undercover investigation of the Pentagon. I really would. I'd launch an undercover investigation, and I would put up with just about anything from our military personnel except willful endangerment of our fighting men below them in order to advance their careers. I'd cashier those people. I'd cashier them publicly. I would, I would, I would um, branded for those of you who are old enough to remember that TV show, I'd put them on a platform and I'd rip the stars off their off their shoulders and I'd break their swords in their faces. That's how I'd cashier them. I'd cashier, I'd cashier them out to the into the into the woods and I'd publish their faces and I, and I'd put them on TV. And I'd make the American people see what what these guys had done. And then I'd go find officers who are out in the field who are trying to keep their guys alive, combat officers, and I'd promote those guys. Um, it's just shocking. It's shocking, but it's true. And and I get to the point where it shouldn't bother me because that's how I've come to realize people are are um, made. That's how people are made. People are made to cover their butts. Uh, George Friedland just said in the comments that fudging tests should be prosecuted the same as sabotage. Completely agree. 
if you're sending people out into a web into a into a vehicle that's supposed to protect you from small arms fire and it doesn't and people die that's the same as putting a bomb in the vehicle if you told them that the um that the vehicle's going to protect them from a certain kind of weapon and you know it won't might as well just shot the weapon at them right it's just appalling it's absolutely appalling and it's like everything else it's the bureaucracy right it's it's not even it's not even the military it's 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 a bureaucracy and once you get into a bureaucracy you have these catastrophic problems it's the bureaucracy that gave us Obamacare and the Obamacare website was designed by a bureaucracy it's the Pentagon bureaucracy that puts water in the fuel tanks of vehicles to test how they do against explosions and it's the NASA bureaucracy that basically says yes we've had burn throughs on the solid, ro solid rocket boosters on seven flights or whatever it was and we go into the solid SRBs and we look and we can see where the exhaust gas have burned through the o-rings and almost burned through the second wall but it hasn't happened yet so let's just keep flying what's the worst that could happen because if the thing uh, doesn't blow up and I report this and we stop the program I'm gonna get chewed out and I'm gonna lose my job maybe or I'm certainly gonna get a severe reprimand on the other hand if I be quiet and uh, don't tell anybody about it then there's a slim chance that seven people will die and we'll lose our ability to get into space for two years and we'll lose a billion dollars of hardware in the bottom of the ocean and our national prestige and our national uh, uh, sense of self-will will be, will be uh, destroyed. But that's a small price to pay uh, so long as they don't get yelled at. And after that happens, and we've got a whole new culture of safety at NASA now after 1986 because we learned our lesson from Challenger. Boy, I'll tell you what, we sure to get into some bad weeds there, but now, thank God, um, we've got ourselves a, a real safety-oriented program in 1986. And I'm sure it was after Challenger for a couple of years when they brought it back. So I'm sure for the late 80s, early 90s, we took a couple of years to get back in the sky, but for the late 80s, early 90s, we're probably thinking along those lines. The next thing you know, it's the late 90s. Now it's the early thousands, and we have had 10 years without a failure in the missions, and uh, we're 14, I guess, we're going to start flying back 88, 89, something like that. So 2002, everything's fine. And so now it's not the O-rings because we fixed that particular problem because it killed seven people. Um, so uh, Amendment X here says the O-rings weren't faulty. They failed at a temperature they weren't designed for. They failed because it was so cold. That was the coldest they've ever launched, also the most turbulent. But they'd had O-ring burns through on several occasions prior to this, so there was a design flaw, which was corrected. Next thing you know, uh, we're flying missions and everything's copacetic and the, uh, the uh, environmental weenies say, uh, hey, we've got to change the foam on the external tank. You know, why? Uh, because uh, it's uh, in environmentally toxic. Do we make a whole lot of this foam? No, but, you know, we don't want to look bad. Oh, okay. So if we don't want to look bad, what are we going to do? We're going to use a new kind of foam. Terrific. Any problems with that? Well, it's, it's environmentally friendly. It just doesn't stick very well. Well, we're going to fly this tank through the atmosphere at supersonic speed, so is this going to be a problem? Now, pieces of it will come off, but what's the worst that could happen? It's just foam. So they start flying these missions, and next thing you know, you see the foam coming off the external tank, and nobody ever thought to say, is this going to damage the orbiter? As a matter of fact, we had so many people assuming it was just foam that even after Ch uh, Columbia disintegrated on reentry and people said it's the foam, the bureaucracy said it's not the foam. How do you know? Because we said so. Really? Yep. How do you know it's not the foam? We've determined that it's not the foam. How did you determine? That's none of your business. Okay, well, we think it's the foam, so you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a piece of foam, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to shoot the foam at 600 miles an hour into the leading edge of the wing of the shuttle. And they did, and guess what happened? It made a hole the size of a suitcase in the leading edge of the wing of the shuttle. So it was the foam. And we knew about it. We'd been seeing it. It was right in front of our eyes, but the bureaucracy meant that nobody is responsible. No one person is responsible. If you stand up and stop a flight, if you basically say, we're stopping this launch, I don't like the foam, you're overruled. Well, if I'm overruled, I'm going to go to the American people through the press. That would be in my job, obviously, but I'm not going to let these people die up there if I, if I can stop it. Nobody did that. Nobody did that. Nobody said, to hell with you, to hell with my job, to hell with everything. It's not safe. I'm going to stop it if I can. I'm going to publicize how dangerous it is. Look, uh, Brent Cates in the comments said that space isn't safe. I'm, I am 100% behind you on this. On the contrary, I think the reason we're, we're doing so badly in space is because we're not killing enough astronauts, because we're not pushing the envelope like we did with, um, with uh, commercial aviation. But it's a different kind of a thing. When you were getting guys killed every, every day out there in Edwards Air Force Base in the 60s, where the chance of returning from a test flight apparently was 25% uh, chance that you're not going to come back from a particular test flight. That's no one survives those kind of odds. How many times can you flip a coin, you know, uh, and come back with 25% chance of being killed? You, you stay in the program long enough, you're going to die. 
But even at that horrific fatality rate, the failures that we were experiencing in in aviation, in flight tests out in Edwards in the 60s, got us enormous benefits. We went from, you know, breaking the speed of sound in, uh, was it 46, 47 with the, um, with the X-1 uh, to Mach 3 in, um, I don't know, 10 years, a little more. Next thing you know, we've got the X-15, which is also right in that time period. And then X- X-15 is a Mach 15 ship and, you know, it's, it's a spaceship. So guys were dying for something. They were they were learning things. They were pushing the envelope. They were out where no one had ever been before. They were they were dying of things that we didn't know existed. They talked about that giant monster that lived on the other side of the sound barrier. They didn't know what was on the other side of the sound barrier. I don't fault people for being killed. They weren't killed in the X-1, but if he had been killed in the X-1 at supersonic flight because they didn't know that a shock wave walks down the leading edge of the, of the horizontal stabilizer until it hits the elevators and then it locks the elevators up. That's what you're supposed to die for. Um, to learn stuff like that. But neither the Challenger or the Columbia were that kind of thing. They were not uh, fatalities that needed to happen. They didn't get us any knowledge that we didn't already have. We were having burn-throughs on the O-rings before Challenger exploded. We were having foam coming off the tank before Columbia um, disintegrated. And when you see these things happening, their obligation, NASA's obligation, was to take that foam and shoot it at the leading edge of that orbiter at at two times the, the force that it could ever experience in the real world and when you see the foam bouncing off of the leading edge at 1,000 miles per hour instead of 500 or 600, and you say, the foam doesn't have the mass to hurt the wing of the shuttle, then you've done your job. But they didn't do that. And when you see burn holes coming through the O-rings uh, on the uh, SRBs, and you see burn-throughs of the SRBs, you better show me some reason why this is not going to cause the failure of the mission, because they knew it would. They just started hoping. They started hoping. You know? Well, hope it'll be okay. And it wasn't. And this is why bureaucracies are the end product of incompetence, and they're and they're the ruin of everything. You know, when you when you do that, you you pay a price. Who's responsible in a bureaucracy? Who's responsible for this? No one. I'm good friends with Bert Rutan, and when Bert Rutan lost two guys in a refueling accident, the first two people ever hurt or killed in the uh, I think Bert Bert just basically dropped out for six months. He couldn't handle it personally. He felt he'd killed those people. He felt he was responsible for it. In some level, he was. He felt like it. He felt responsible. He took responsibility for, the, for, the, for his company. He's the head of the company. And I assure you that those problems will not happen again. And I assure you that that effect, he, he ran such a safe, safe shop for so long. I mean, he put people into outer space on $20 million, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable, really, $30 million. He put people in outer space, didn't just build a spaceship, built a space program. And um, he got through the program completely, not not so much as a person got scratched on that program. It only happened afterwards. I think it was on Spaceship Two where they were working. If he'd known that there was a danger, he wouldn't have said, well, let's just see if it's okay. He wouldn't have done a risk calculation. He would have fixed it. So um, that's the difference, in my opinion. And I think the bureaucracies are a real mess. And what got us there? I guess it was the... Um, the question about uh, Obama not being able to pass uh, join the Marines. Marines. He couldn't join, I don't think Barack Obama could, could join the Weeblos. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, Allo Constant says, a question from the virtual press to the virtual future, roughly January 2014 or so. Mr. Virtual President, the mass protests in the Ukraine have toppled the Yanovich, Yan, I'm sorry, Yanukovych government. In response to the new anti-Russia government that took over, Vladimir Putin today cut off all natural gas exports to the Ukraine in the dead of winter. What do you intend to do? I intend to set up a um, an energy airlift into the Ukraine. The people of America have an excess of natu- natural gas. The people of the Ukraine have an, a large number of other um, uh, natural resources that we needless to say are very interested in, and we're more than happy to extend them the credit. So we're going to begin uh, airdropping uh, large quantities of liquid natural gas to keep these people from freezing and let them know that they have a friend, a friend in freedom across the ocean where friends of freedom have always been. And um, the Ukraine being a sovereign nation, this is certainly within our rights to do this, and if we have any interference with these uh, airdrops of, uh, of uh, uh, liquefied natural gas and other means to get these people through their upcoming freezing winter, then that will create serious problems for the uh, Russian government. If any of those vehicles are fired on, needless to say, we'll consider it an act of war by the uh, Russian Republic against the United States of America. Any questions? 
No? Okay. Um, we're not going to sell them the gas. We're going to give them the gas. And they can pay us back later. Because if they're fighting for freedom, we're on their side. And if uh, the government of Russia wants to be the bullies that they always have been traditionally and that they remain to be today, Yano, 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 Yanukovych, sorry about that, uh, if they want to continue to be the kind of bullies that they are, then we'll make the world well aware of who and what they are. And if they want to uh, intimidate the Ukraine by this action, they're not going to succeed. If they think they're going to freeze those people to death, they're not going to succeed. America will not let that happen. We'd like to get our uh, European allies involved with that, but we're going to do it anyway. And if the Russians decide that it's important enough to go to war with the United States in order to prevent this from happening, there's nothing I can do about that. That's going to be Mr. Putin's decision. But we're going to get them some natural gas, and we're going to get them the energy they need to stay through the winter. And they're going to remind them that we have a friend here in the United States, and um, they can pay us back later when they're out of trouble. Next question. Um, Charles Tomes asks, if Buckaroo Banzai built an interplanetary transport ship, would it have a zero-g swimming pool as shielding? Interesting. Um... Yes, uh, Buckaroo would be able to do anything he wants to. Buckaroo would probably turn it into a zero-g uh, swimming pool with martini service on the side. Um, the reason I like the question is because uh, uh, it's not something... I'll, I'll get to this eventually in Aurora when I get off of the propulsion thing start talking about the rest of the design. If you look closely at the renderings of Aurora, you'll see the outermost of the habitation modules that are only showed retracted. I don't think I've got any drawings of them fully extended yet, but they rotate for um, artificial gravity. And if you look at the outside, they look very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they look like a kind of a fabric. And a lot of people assume they were inflatables, but they're not really inflatables. I may end up making them inflatables because I've gotten to like inflatables better uh, over time. But originally, they were designed to be water bags. And as, um, as I'm pointing out in the Aurora updates, uh, the vehicle is not the vehicle they wanted to have. They had an engine with a tremendous efficiency, tremendously energetic engine. They lose the engine in the first scene in the movie, and now they have to deal with a much less powerful, uh, much less efficient engine, which means that all of the parameters of the flight change. And so, since they have to launch very quickly, they don't get a chance to really redo this, and their, their kind of, you know, workaround, which is a sloppy thing that engineers just despise, is they're going to just take these giant canvas bags and bolt them to the outside of these HAB modules, and then they're going to take the wastewater from the HAB modules and pump them into the bags, so that as they get further and further away from Earth, the bags um, get filled up more and more with wastewater. And the reason I think that's interesting is because water is a remarkable substance in so many ways. Most people don't understand it. But by the time you get out to Jupiter, you've got a fair, you know, you've got, you know, I don't know, a couple of feet of water uh, where, where you need it. Um, and uh, water is a tremendous uh, radiation shield. Uh, it's not as good as lead, but um, it's awful good. It's not as heavy as lead, and it doesn't present some of the spalling problems either. Water is better than some things. Sometimes the lead shielding or will gets hit by high-energy particle, and it creates a scattering of other particles, which isn't so good. It turns a bullet into a shotgun blast, basically. Um, but the water is terrific, and um, and water is uh, really useful as a radiation shield. And, and we've got it in the first episode, the first movie uh, on Aurora, on the Aurora mission. Movie number two is called. Um, Ice Station series, and that's actually a space combat movie with uh, this little 300-person company going to war with China. Uh, and the um, the Chinese ship in movie number two is a uh, is a uh, energy weapons platform. So basically, the Chinese ship has a humongous uh, laser. Um, and the American ship is going to use a kinetic weapon. Uh, a rail launcher and a missile, kind of thing, a rail launcher. Uh, and so the the energy weapon has the advantage in terms of it's got range and it's got, it, it, it can hit further away and it can hit more accurately, but it doesn't do as much damage. Um, it's a little easier to protect against a um, heat attack that a laser would deliver. Uh, you can put a reflective shield up there. You can launch, um, in travel, it was called sandcasters. It would just basically sp explode glitter sand out between you and the laser and that sand would dissipate an awful lot of the incoming energy basically so putting a big shield up before it gets to you there's no defense against a kinetic weapon you take a uh, you know a hockey puck and you accelerate it fast enough and hit the ship with that it's going to destroy that ship 
So um, the reason I bring that up is because they see this uh, Chinese ship. They don't know anything about it, really, just a couple of intelligence pictures, and they, they get a rough look at the general layout of it. It's got this gigantic tank uh, of water, and water is a pretty good uh, propulsion system. Uh, if you have a nuclear engine, you need to put the the fuel tanks on Aurora, for example, technically speaking, are not filled with fuel. They're filled filled with liquid hydrogen, but liquid hydrogen is not the fuel. Uh, liquid hydrogen is just the propellant mass. Uh, it's the reaction mass. So liquid hydrogen doesn't combine with anything, and liquid oxygen goes over the super hot reactor core, and then the liquid hydrogen expands, and that provides the thrust. But it's not actually the fuel. The actual fuel is the uranium in the engine, in, if you want to be uh, specific about it. But if you're carrying water, you can put water over the reactor core, and you get a less energetic reaction than you do with liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen is a little more efficient. Methane is better than water, and uh, liquid hydrogen is the best. But you can pour water over it. But anyway, they don't know what this thing is. And this, this weapon, when they get out into the combat zone, uh, the laser that comes at them is much more powerful than they expected, much more powerful. It's got much, much higher um, energy output, and more interestingly, its cycle time is much faster. They didn't think they, they don't know how they can get rid of the heat fast enough. They're running, they're running so much energy into the, um, into the laser, the Chinese ship is. They're running so much energy into the laser, and they're cycling it so fast, they don't know how they can shed the heat. By the way, the radiators on the back of Aurora, uh, most people... Um, don't understand really how hard it is to dissipate heat in a vacuum. Here on Earth, if you put a radiator like in your car, the heat is carried away by the atmosphere. The molecules of the atmosphere take the heat away. Uh, water cooling is much more efficient because the density of the molecules is so much higher. So if you water cool something, the water is much more, much, much more efficient at getting the heat away than air is. But at least air is something. Uh, in space, you're trying to radiate heat out into a vacuum, and you use a vacuum in a thermos to make sure that the heat doesn't get radiated. So um, getting rid of waste heat is a major, major, major problem just for a regular mission on a warship. I imagine it's going to be the problem if you're running energy weapons. So you have to generate a hell of a lot of energy, and you only ever get a certain amount of efficiency no matter how good you are. That waste heat has to go someplace, and it's got to go off into space. So they can't imagine how these Chinese are cycling this heat fast enough, and it turns out that the giant thing that they thought is a, is a water fuel tank is a water fuel tank, but what it really is is it's a heat sink. They're basically taking the energy from the reactor that they're using to power the laser, and they're pumping it into this water tank. And you can pump a lot of energy into water. You can heat water. Water will absorb an awful lot of, uh, of energy. And so they only realize once they're in battle with this thing that this thing that they thought could hit them a couple times is hitting them all the time and much harder than they ever thought it would based on their calculations. They hadn't overlooked the fact that this giant, humongous hunk of water was going to pull a lot of heat, be a good heat sink. So the theory would be you'd warm the water, warm the water, warm it, warm it, warm it, warm it, get it really hot, get it boiling hot. And then over time, after you've killed the enemy, you just let the heat radiate out into space slowly. The main thing is you can, you can pump a lot of heat into it in a short period of time. And a couple people out there talking about my traveler days asking me if it's a scout ship or a subsidized liner. If you start in the basic traveler game back in the day when I did in the late 70s, I guess, when you mustered out of the service, or depending on the service and you were in, if you were lucky, and everybody managed to get lucky here, uh, would be um, did you want to have a small trading vessel or did you want to have a small scout ship? And the small scout ship, the Type S scout ship and traveler, for those of few of you who've ever played traveler, the Type S scout ship and Traveler looks like a very, very, very small, looks like a two-person Imperial Star Destroyer. It's like a battle wedge. looks exactly like that. And if you started traveling, you got out of the scout service in Traveler, and you had a Type S scout with a laser on, on one mount and a sandcaster on the other, you had the, the weakest arm ship in the entire uh, galaxy, but, man, you felt like the king of the world with that thing. You can't wait to get out there and upgrade that thing and, you know, get a missile launcher for it or whatever. Even the weaklings, even the little tiny Type 1 lasers you put on there was just great. So uh, I actually loved designing ships in Traveler. I had a really great ship called the Promethean Fire. It was a badass-looking thing, too, and a tremendous ship. Anyway, had the deck plans for everything. That was fabulous. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's the interplanetary transport question for Buckaroo Banzai. Thanks, Charles. Uh, still got a bunch to go here. Yeah, we're going to run over, but not too much longer. I hope not like last time. Uh, Jim Reinheimer says, I once owned an auto, parts, auto parts, an auto parts store, and on one occasion, 
I threw a customer out for abusive language. Did I violate his free speech rights? Does the baker who chooses not to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple violate their rights? That baker has been ordered by the court to serve these customers regardless of the baker's religious beliefs. This is one of the most oppressive and disgusting things I've ever seen. If you run a private business at private property, you have the absolute right, in my opinion, to determine who you're going to serve and who you're not going to serve. You can't be made to serve somebody. You can't be made to provide service to somebody you don't want to. No shirt, no shoes, no service. If I don't like the way you look, too bad for you. And that goes for everything. You know, if you want to be the kind of the kind of jerk that wants to say no black customers in my restaurant, you should have that right. And people should have a right to protest you, and they should have a right to certainly, they without question have the right to not come to your crummy racist restaurant. But if you're telling people that they have to serve people, they have to provide service no matter what, legally, it's where does that end? It doesn't end anywhere. It's not private property anymore. It's not your business anymore. Right? It's your business. You set it up. You should be able to run it any way you want to. And if you want to be an exclusionary jackass or if you want to have whatever particular opinions, and sometimes they're not jackass opinions. If somebody is, uh, is using foul language in your story, you have every right to throw that person out and deny them service and never let them in again. It's your business. It's private property. These people hate private property because without, if, if you have private property, ultimately you are the king of your own castle, right? You're the lord of your own domain. I don't like that. Well, you may not approve of this, but this is my house, and as long as you're living under my roof, you will follow my rules. Hey, that works for me, man. Um, it really works for me. Yeah, you will go in there and you will bake them a cake. And that cake will not be any better or worse than any other you know, to hell with you. I, I, I would have closed the store. I really would have. I would have closed the store over it um, and opened it someplace else, someplace free, free or it's slavery. That's what um, that's uh, 608 in the comment section said. It is slavery. It's indentured servitude. We're making you do something you don't want to do. No, you have the right. Per you have the perfect right not to do that. And this whole idea of being offended, it's like they offended me by not serving me. Well, too bad for you. They didn't like your lifestyle. You don't like their lifestyle. Don't serve them. You know, if the baker decides he doesn't want to bake you a cake because you're a lesbian, then um, don't uh, don't rotate his tires at your tire store or whatever else you got. You know, boom. He certainly works both ways. I don't think anybody have any problem with that. You go to a lesbian tire store or something, and you find out that uh, they find out that you're a fundamentalist Christian. They decide they don't want to serve you. That's their right, right? Public buildings and public services are something completely different. Public services have to be completely um, non-discriminating. They have to appeal to everybody. That's why they're public. You can't tell somebody you can't get on a bus because you're gay or you're black or whatever because the bus is owned by everybody. But if you have a car business, you should be able to say, I don't like the looks of you. And people say, well, that's not fair. It doesn't have to be fair. It's his business. And frankly... If it turns out that there's so much unfairness that the large numbers of people are not getting taxi service, then a taxi service will come along and it'll appeal only to them. Uh, and I don't see that happening. I mean, I don't think that's likely to happen at all. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's largely, um, you know, silly. I think most people, you can't tell anything about them by their um, appearance or their lifestyle. I, I, I discriminate daily. Uh, but my discrimination is based on are they good folks or bad folks. I mean... You know, people say, well, what's your opinion of black people? I don't have an opinion about black people. I don't see black people as black people. I don't just deny the whole concept. Who are you talking about? What do you think about gays? Which one? Which one? That guy's a complete jackass. The other guy's awesome. He's terrific. Uh, that's how I see people, and I should have a right to do whatever I want to with them on my property. It's my business. So I think um, I think that's really about it. Uh, yeah, you have a perfect right to do that. And that's the whole idea of a private business. And that, that, that goes to large companies, too. If Starbucks wants to do something, it's their business. If trick fil wants to do something else, that's their business. If Ben & Jerry's wants to do something else in their stores, that's their business. If I don't like it, I don't have to go there. You know, I found Ben & Jerry's ice cream to be really awful ice cream, by the way. Uh, just really, just not very good. But um, I don't like Ben & Jerry's politics, and I don't patronize Ben & Jerry's unless I absolutely have to. And uh, if I felt more strongly about their politics, I wouldn't do it then. But um, anyway, that's how I feel about it. I think that's the, I think it's the conservative answer, right? Is uh, no, we're not, we're not going to bend to your will. This is my business, my company. I do whatever I want with it. If it's a private company, it's their their company. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Kua says, 3D printing guns, yay. Um, 
I saw a 3D printer two days ago in an office supply store. Well, two days ago was yesterday. Um, and uh, I saw this little castle that they'd printed on this little machine. I don't know, it looked like the machine cost a couple hundred bucks, and it was uh, made out of green plastic, and it was in the general shape of a castle. I thought, well, that's nice. And then I looked closely, and I realized, oh, it's got little brick patterns on the outside. That's cool. In fact, the brick patterns have little details inside the bricks. And I thought, that was cool. And I looked down the middle, and there was a spiral staircase about as narrow as a couple strains of, uh, of hair, honestly, about the width of three or two or three bits of dental floss side by side. This little spiral staircase inside the um, inside the center of this tiny little rook of a castle about that big, and it was spectacular. And the guy said, wow, it's a 3D printer, honey. He says, yeah. I said, how much does it cost? He said, I don't know. It just got here. And then he immediately starts by saying, I'm a little worried about this. Yeah, how so? Well, you know, you, apparently you can use these things to print guns and stuff. Oh, no. Guns? Really? That's awful. Um, yeah, apparently they'll explode or something. I said, well, if it explodes, then that's not good. But, you know, if it doesn't, Three D printing is going to change the world. Uh, y y you know, there's a uh, famous thing in uh, sci-fi with something called a, a von Neumann machine or a Santa Claus machine, and basically it's a sci-fi printer that can print its own. Um, so if it print its own self, so the first you'll you'll know you've arrived when you have a three um, D printer that can manufacture a robot, and then the robot you have to build the first robot. But then the robot assembles other robots that build other three D printers that print out other robot parts that build other three D printers, and basically then you're good to go. Um, yeah, I, I think we're so early in this technology. I mean, we're really, really, with 3D printing, we're actually kind of like those guys at DARPA, you know? It's like they've sent, um, they've sent a, you know, a five-word logon to uh, another computer, and they got four, a five-letter logon, and they got four letters right, and it came back a failure on the fifth letter. Oh, we got to keep trying on this. we got to get this modem up to, you know, seven baud or something. Um we're really so early in the beginning of this, but honestly, I think it's going to change the world. They already have printed um, dresses, printed clothes. I've seen a machine print organs. If you look for uh, printed organs on YouTube, you'll see a little machine that's squirting out gel, and it lays up. It ha you can't just build a, a heart and just have it sit there because it's jello. So basically what you're doing is you're, you're printing, you print like, uh, just imagine it as um, like a, I think it's like an agar kind of a, uh, just a protein piece. Imagine it's clear jello, okay? So you're just printing clear jello, 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 jello. Here's a little splurt of kidney um, uh, stem cells. Jello, jello, squirt, jello, jello, squirt, 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 jello, squirt, 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 squirt. And it just builds it up. And the next thing you know, you've got a hollow kidney and it's an organ and it works just fine. You, you, you know, unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And um, you get into the protein structure of soft tissues like uh, hearts and kidneys and it turns out soft tissues have their own skeletal structure you can actually bleed all the cells out of a kidney take every single pig cell out of a kidney take every single pig cell out of it and you're left with something that looks like a ghost kidney like a kidney that's made out of smoke and it's actually just the protein structure underneath the cells and since it doesn't have any cells on it it's no longer the, the pig's kidney it's got no um, cells that that your immune system can react to it's literally just a, a structure and I've seen it on on video so they bleached all this, all the cells out of this pig's kidney, left it with this structure. Then they took human stem cells and poured it into this thing, basically poured it over it, and it assumed the shape of a kidney. And it was that person's kidney because it was that person's stem cells. They transplant. They did it with a. They've done it at least. I've seen the kidney. They've actually transplanted um, a trachea that way. They took out a, a, a trachea from either another human or or some some animal. They, they killed all of this person's cells. They took the cells out of it, left just with this protein structure, took that person's stem cells, coated it over this trachea structure. It became a living trachea. They transplanted it into this woman's neck, and she was shopping the next day. And she, she was shopping the next day with a brand-new trachea that was her trachea. Yeah, man, we're getting there. You know, if only society and politics can hang out long enough for science and technology to kick us into gear. It's a, just a race, honestly. Our technical skills are getting so remarkable and our mental and political and moral slide is accelerating. It's like, who's going to get there first? I don't feel good about it, but you never know. Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, I have four more to go, I guess. Um, Bomar Punk says, how should someone with ideas for common sense resistance videos and such approach you? Um, 
right now, I should say, for those of you who sent in names for wrenches, we uh, had to turn them down because we um, we don't have the means to do common sense resistance yet. When we get the members, we will. Um, once that happens, I talk to our web guy, and we basically have found a way to have um, just an automated system that basically says, if it turns out that we have five email addresses, then you will get a random name for your wrench. It'll be CSR Cadillac or CSR, you know, um, Pillbox or whatever the case may be. Um, and then as far as the videos go, I've given this a little thought. Uh, what we really would like is we would like, um, we would like, for people to be making their own videos and if the thing really takes off to that degree that's great and we'd love to use user-generated com com um, content so that's all good there's one problem here and it's a problem I really hate dealing with it really is and it's the problem of user submissions and if we took 50 user submissions there would probably be five or ten of them that we just wouldn't want to use for one reason or another maybe the uh, maybe the either the acting quality or the technical quality, or what, although the whole purpose of Common Sense Resistance videos is to be shot with a handheld camera in nowhere. So it's not a tough hurdle, but there would be something about them that we just didn't like enough. And then we would, you know, what, what would we do? Um, and I think what we probably have to do, I mean, it, honestly, on some level, we're assuming this thing really takes off. You're, you're in the position, I would be in the position of the, of the uh, producers of uh, America's Funniest Home Videos, right? I get thousands and thousands and thousands of videos a week, and I have to decide which 25 or 30 we're going to use. Um, and I don't want to uh, discourage anybody from doing that. So I think probably the short-form answer to your question will be um, that we'll take a look at all user submissions, and if it's something that we like, and we'll like anything that fits, you know, anything that we're, we're not going to have like a limited structure. I mean, as long as it doesn't not work for one reason, um, I think what we'll do is we'll um, we'll uh, have a we already have a CSR channel reserved on uh, YouTube, and that'll be kind of the official channel. But you can post it on YouTube all you want to. So, like anything else in sci-fi and, and comics, what we'll probably end up having to do is divide the world into canonical and non-canonical. Uh, things where we put our imprimatur on things that we think work for the common sense resistance as whatever arbiters of taste, but the fact is we don't own it, we don't control it, and we wouldn't want to. We certainly wouldn't want to disqualify or discourage anybody. So if it turns out you make a video and you think it's really great and for some reason or another we just don't think it, it it's something we want to put on the main page, then by all means put it up and, and, and genuine, sincere good luck to you. But there does come a point where I think we have to protect uh, the the brand in terms of um, the quality of what we put out there, of what of what we kind of allow to go out there under the official canon, and I think that's probably the best compromise you can get. I know there's um, you know there's the official Star Trek history, official Star Wars history. There's ten thousand pieces of fan fiction and footage and you know and episodes and original series remakes and all that stuff is terrific, but you can't very well go out and make. Star Trek Three, you know the the uh, Abrams third movie, um, based on something that happened in a fan based film on YouTube. You can't if somebody in the fan based film on YouTube decided that they'd killed all the Klingons. Let's say you can't very well expect the main franchise to have to obey by those rules. So there's canonical and non canonical, and I don't know of any other way to do it. But we will set up a place where you can submit them, and we'll take a look at them, and we'll um, we'll we, we want to run them all. And I hope we can. And uh, likely we'll be able to run almost all of them. And they'll go up on the Canonical site, and uh, and they'll be part of the uh, ongoing, you know, history and sort of mythos of uh, the Common Sense Resistance. And if there's something we that, that you guys decide to do we really like, we'll just work it in. It'll be great. But there will be some that we won't be able to. And we would strongly encourage you to put them up on your own. Just start a YouTube channel and put them up. You can call it whatever you want to. Um, so... You can call it common sense resistance. I mean, you can call your channel whatever you want to. So hopefully that answers your question for you. And man, am I looking forward to being able to do this stuff? It's really just um, just a question of time. Hopefully we get to it in um, in uh, January, uh, February, somewhere in there, as the things continue to come in. Uh, four to go here. Uh, Adam Hansen says, "It seems to me that there's more of an ideological war going on." for America than for any other classification of war brought on in the name of safety as an inappropriate response to fear, i.e. safety first. I've struggled overcoming my fears so that I can be in control of my own life. However, this is not the case with someone very close to me. 
Would you be willing to share an experience of how you overcame a fear of yours so that I may understand another perspective in order to help this person who is close to me? Wow, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, there's two things I guess I would say to that. Um, I'm not aware that I have any phobias. I don't believe I've ever had any irrational fears. It's not like spiders or anything really sets me off. I have been frightened before, and there have been things I've done that were that were scary that required some courage to do. Um, but uh, I think I think what we're really dealing with here is a two-part um, issue. And I'll, I'll go to the most important part first. I know this is going to sound an odd thing to say, honestly. I don't know how you would really tell somebody else this, but it, this is what works for me. And I suspect if you get into people who risk their lives routinely, and people in our military or the first responders, um, I think uh, I think you'll you'll probably find this is true. Uh, and I have to make a note. Somebody just made some comment I really like a lot. Um, so I think the first thing I would say is uh, when I was flying gliders, I had a, a couple of really just world peak world experiences out there. Just moments where I just thought, my God, this is the whole reason I'm alive. is just going to be able to say I did this. And I can't, I can't tell you the value of that. I can't tell you the value of, of, of basically talking to somebody uh, and, and, and getting to the place where I am where I never expected to have these things happen to me. I've done so many things that are beyond um, my hopes and so many things that I think well, so many humans have spent their entire lives wishing they could do. One of these things is have a hot meal and a warm place to sleep. Uh, you know, when you get grateful for that kind of stuff, that does an awful lot. And it's really important to get grateful for that kind of stuff. And for the people that make sure we continue to have those hot meals in a warm and safe place to sleep. I try to think about them every day, if I can. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is one of the reasons I don't feel, find myself filled with the fear of dying that I used to have is because I've done enough with my life now that I feel like I've, um, I feel like I've accomplished something Um important and uh, and it doesn't have to be this whole you know uh, notoriety or fame thing either it's just have you have you done something um you know that makes you feel like your life is worth living and i think if you if you can look at your life and say i've done things that were worth living then your fear of dying gets significantly reduced uh i really do believe that um i've often said to myself well this is going to require some courage or some kind of uh, grit to pull this off and I think about all the 18 year olds that are out there in Afghanistan and Iraq and these people haven't had, I'm 54, I've had 54 years of life, I've dated some really smoking hot women and I've um, and I've driven fast cars and I've flown in airplanes and I've been on TV and I've done things that were important to me your set of values are likely very different and hopefully are different um, but if you can check off on your list the things that you've achieved and you think about all the people in history who've died before they were even, you know died in childhood, died before they were old enough to reproduce. You're, you're the product of survivors going back all the way. That's an amazing thought if you think about it. Um, and so appreciation for your life and what you've achieved gives you a sense of um, of looking at the flip side of the, all the things I wanted to do and never got to do kind of thing. There's all the things I did do. And um, I think everybody should be living that li their life that way. And if you get down to it, really, it again, it doesn't have to be these big, you know, fame and fortune things. They were important to me because the path I wanted to follow. So, um, but everybody has their own path and everybody has their own milestones on that path. If you opened a business, that's a huge thing. You paid people's, maybe you paid somebody's paycheck. That's remarkable. It's an achievement. It really is. And if you can get into a place where you understand all the achievements of your life and, and your children, uh, you know, family, all that stuff, uh, the people, teachers, whatever, whatever it is, uh, military you know, defended your country and, and, you know, and, you signed on the dotted line. You took a risk that puts you in, in the same category of heroes, of people that I'll never be. I'll never be that guy. I've always wanted to be, and I never will. I'll never be, I'll never have, be able to say that. Never was, I was, bottom line is never good enough to be a uh, pilot for the U.S. military. Um, so there's that. And then I think the other thing, too, is uh, in terms of a fear, I think you really do need to walk it uh, in small doses. I think when you're dealing with a real big fear or a regular fear, I think you're. I think you really have to go at this like you're going into the swimming pool. It's really cold. The, the two schools of thought are one little step at a time or the giant leap. And I actually am one of those small steps at a time thing. I'll put my toes in until they warm up, and then I go up to my kneecaps, and you know it's time consuming and it's hard. And it's probably the sissy way to do it, but that's how I am. Um, 
I think uh, what you're really trying to do here with the fear is you're trying to get the fear in limited doses so that you become, uh, what's the word, uh, you develop a kind of an immunity to it, right? You, you, you people who, um, the people who handle snakes, for example, there was a guy at Serpent World or what, Serpentarium, Miami Serpentarium, uh, he'd been handling poisonous snakes his entire life, and apparently he'd get bitten by rattlesnakes and not even feel it, cobras. He's built up such a resistance and immunity to uh, snake venom. So I think what you do if you have a, a particular fear is you, you take it in little doses. You know, if it's a fear of spiders, I think what you really need to do is, you know, go find spiders with, with somebody who you trust and who you feel strongly with and, and look at them from a distance and spend some time looking at them and take a step closer to them and not, um, not, uh, not you know, run out in panic. And I think you can actually get acclimated to this sort of thing. Uh, I know um, I know one thing... Uh, I've had uh, I've been very fortunate with this. I've had a chance, and I don't know, it must be something about my personality or something, but I've had a chance to take several people flying, a couple times in gliders and many times in my uh, in my little airplane. Desensitization is the term. Thanks, Viper. Uh, the I've taken a lot of people for for airplane rides from people who were really scared to be flying, and I don't even know why they agreed to do it. it must be something that gave them um, a sense of confidence. But, you know, you occasionally hear stories about people who are pilots who have somebody, a passenger, who's really scared, and they give them the, hey, the plane's uh, crashing kind of thing. Those people ought to be taken out and beaten, really. Not to death, but enough so that they don't do it again. Um, when I take people to fly, everybody, but especially people who are afraid to fly, no matter who I'm taking to fly for the first time, I tell them everything that's going on, and I tell them what's going to happen. I'll say, uh, when we're, we're on climb out, for example, I'll say, okay, so we're at 500 feet, so we're going to um, we're going to raise the flaps, and you'll feel the plane settle just a little bit, just a little, feel a little tiny little settling, and the flaps come up, and they feel that. And when we're um, getting ready to go in the takeoff, uh, in the run up, I'm, I've spent a lot of time on this. I'll say, okay, so what we're going to do now is we've got uh, dual electronic controls on this airplane, dual electrical controls, I should say. They're called magnetos, and what that means is is that as long as the engine is turning, it's going to make a spark on your car engine if you lose your battery. If the electrical system goes out, the, the engine stops running. But a magneto means as long as the engine is turning, it's going to make its own spark for the spark plugs. And we have two of those. We have two completely independent systems. I'm saying all this through my headsets. And I said, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn one of them off now. And, and, and you'll hear the engine come down just a little bit. So, so we're working on the other one. That's good. Turn the first one back on. Now we'll turn the other one off. Yeah, good, good. A little bit of a drop. It's what you'd expect. But they're both working independently so that one can fail. Let's turn on our auxiliary fuel pump. Now, we have an auxiliary fuel pump because there's a pump on the engine that's turned by the motion of the engine turning. But that pump runs all the time. And if the engine should, if that pump should fail, there won't be fuel getting to the engine, and the engine will stop running pretty quickly. So we have a second pump, a backup pump. It's an electrical pump. And we turn it on for takeoffs and for landings. And so we're going to turn it on now so that if the main pump fails, we've got a backup pump running. And I'm always ready for every landing and every takeoff. I say usually takeoff. I'll say, and, and frankly, I prepare every takeoff to have an engine failure at the worst possible moment. Every time I take off from a runway, I expect um, the engine to fail at the worst possible place. So as we're doing the takeoff roll, I'm going to tell you what I would do if we were to lose the engine on a takeoff. This is how I was learned. This is how I learned how to fly from flight instructors who did this in gliders because we would have to be ready for a rope break. A rope break is a hundred times, thousand times more likely than an engine failure, so we had to be prepared for power loss at the worst possible time in a glider takeoff. So we start down the runway. Okay, here we go. Ready? Full power. You ready to go? Here we go. Okay, and the engine gauges are good. They're right where we want them to be. Here comes our airspeed. Our airspeed is live at 40 knots. There's 50, 55, a little bit of back pressure, a little bit of back pressure, back pressure, back pressure. Here we go, and we're off. Fantastic. Right now, if we lose the engine, we're going to land straight ahead. Can land straight ahead on the runway, straight ahead on the runway. Okay, we're too high for the runway. I'm going to put her down in that field over there on the left now. Field on the left, field on the left. There's five, 600 feet. Now I'm high enough so that if we got in trouble, I could make a safe turn back and we go back and land on the runway. Now at 500 feet, we can turn off the auxiliary fuel pump because if the engine fails now, we got time to turn that pump back on again. And by doing all this stuff, what the what the what the people in the you would think they would be more afraid because you're talking about failures and catastrophes, but they're thinking about failures and catastrophe anyway. And so what you're really doing is you're telling them it's not just you who's worried about the plane coming out of the sky; it's me. I'm worried about it all the time. And here's what we're doing to make sure that doesn't happen. And for some reason or another, that has a magical effect on people. 
And been many times in, an, um, in a commercial jet, I've been flying with somebody who's nervous, and, you know, and stuff. And you can tell they're really nervous. And I'll say, okay, we're going to take off right. And so if the engine fails now, we're just going to keep climbing. And you'll hear a little thump because they're bringing up the landing gear. They don't know what that thump is. You know, many people who fly irregularly think that thump is something hit the airplane or there's something wrong. And you tell them things like um, there's never been an airplane in the modern era, in the jet era, there's never been an airplane that fell apart because of turbulence because it can't. The plane cannot come apart in turbulence. The plane is certified to take the kind of loads that the atmosphere cannot dish out. Those of you who are pilots out there, you know that's as long as you're flying uh, in the green arc. Um, but when you run into turbulence, you get it down to the green arc. So the plane simply will fall out of the sky before it'll break. Uh, that's what they're designed to do. The wing is designed to stall before it'll snap the wing. So it's never happened. And you'd say to people, have you ever been in a boat in the ocean? Uh, you know, large, large boat? Yep. Have you ever worried that the waves would smash the boat? No. You worry the boat may be turned over. So you never worry that the boat will just come apart because of the waves, right? No, nope. because boats are designed to take the waves, right? Yep. Airplanes the same way. Um, and those things really help. And so, and so what happens is you give people a sense that they do have something to do with it, that they're, that they're involved um, in, it, in the process. And then they know that somebody's thinking about it, and they get, uh, they, get a, they get a lot better. And so what that really means, though, Adam, is that means they have a flight where they're not worried. And every single one of those flights with people who've told me in advance that they really get freaked out in airplanes, I say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to taxi, and then we're going to start our takeoff. And I can abort the takeoff up to a certain point. And if, you, if you're not happy, you let me know. We'll just abort the takeoff. It's perfectly safe, 100% safe, and we will just taxi back to the, to the runway. But once we do the takeoff, we're going to be committed to be in the air for about three or four minutes. That's how long it's going to take me to get around the pattern and bring you back again. We understand this before we go? Absolutely. Here we go. We start the takeoff. Said, how are you feeling? Doing good. Great. We'll keep climbing. Doing good? Yep. All right. We're going to go around. You want to, you want to get your spec? No, I'm okay. I'm actually okay. Next thing you know, um, these people want to go, they want to do wingovers because they're so elated uh, as a matter of just uh, not being so scared. So I would say incremental doses of desensitization, uh, Adam, and, and, and depending on how serious the fear is, you know, an appreciation for how much you've achieved. You know, if somebody's afraid of skydiving, you don't probably want to start the conversation by saying, well, you've led a good life anyway. Um, but it helps me. Uh, so three to go. Uh, Sherry Johnson says, was it appropriate for the president to take a smiling from ear to ear selfie at a funeral, followed right behind by uh, Jenna... Rianne uh, Murphy says, I just don't have words for this man anymore, although Michelle's face is pretty much the funniest thing I've seen all day. What are your thoughts? For those of you who haven't seen it, um, Obama took some selfies uh, at uh, the Mandela uh, ceremony, and um, he was uh, taking selfies and kind of chatting up uh, the Danish prime minister who's a blonde woman, who's they're calling her really hot. I don't think she's super hot, but she's, she's attractive. Uh, blonde. And um, and there's a series of pictures where you see uh, Obama taking a selfie with this woman and somebody else, and then you see him talking to her, and Michelle is just just shooting daggers out of her eyes. And then the next thing you know, she switched seats with Obama. There's a lot to say about this. A lot to say about this. First of all, these people don't like each other, and they never have. I really mean it. I think Michelle Obama is one of the most mean-spirited people in the world. Uh, I think Barack, actually, you know, the only person... Uh, the only person I ever see Obama, the only time I actually feel sympathetic towards Obama is when he's with his wife. That's the only time I actually really kind of like the guy. Because when he's with his wife, he seems a little looser and more friendly and laughing a little more. And she just looks like one of the meanest person that ever lived. I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt at all that she meant it. She'd never been proud of this country before her husband was a uh, candidate for the presidency. Um, and so looking at Michelle's face, I just realized what I've always known about Michelle. She's a, just a harpy. She's a shrew. She, he married a Valkyrie, and he knows it. Uh, so I'm sympathetic to, uh, to Barry on this one to the degree that I think he's married to a very mean-spirited, nasty, angry, controlling woman. Now we get into a larger issue. Uh, when you hear Obama talk about uh, Michelle and you hear Michelle talk about Barack, it's extremely, extremely dysfunctional and childish. Um, she will say things like, he, his, his, his feet smell, and I don't let him do this, and he doesn't pick up his underwear and all this other stuff. She'll say this on Oprah, and everybody titters and giggles, and it's like, you know, if that was my wife out there, 
uh, and said, oh, and she got on the Oprah show, watched by millions of people. I'm running for president. She says, oh, he leaves his dirty underwear around, and sometimes he, he doesn't take a shower and he smells bad, and, and, um, and I have to constantly remind him to pick up his socks and all this other stuff. The second that woman comes home, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting her down. I'm saying, we're going to have a conversation right now. Okay, you will never, ever, ever discuss those qualities of our personal life to anybody anywhere ever again or else you are going to be divorced from me very, very quickly. I will not be embarrassed by my wife like this. It's got nothing to do with me being president of the United States. You will not ever speak about me in public the way you spoke about me on that show again or else you're going to be a single woman. Do we understand each other on this? Are we crystal clear on this? Crystal clear? Okay, because I don't talk about you that way and you're not going to talk about me that way. That's absolutely not going to happen. I will divorce you in a heartbeat before I will allow people to think that I am being ruled by you like I'm some kind of 10-year-old boy. Honestly, you really go out there and make me make me look like a 10-year-old child? I'm the president of the United States of America, for God's sakes. You will not discuss anything like this with me ever again. And next time you speak about me in public, it'll be affectionately, humorously, or reverently, at least respectfully. You will never speak about these kind of things again in public, or else I will divorce you on the Oprah show. We clear on this, Michelle? Good. That's the first thing. If the guy can't be the, if the guy cannot, if the guy cannot be the head of his own household, how is he supposed to run the country? If 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 you don't think that the Russians and the Chinese study the body language of this guy, and when you hear him talk about Michelle, it's it's the mirror image of everything that he says about her. Michelle doesn't let me watch uh, too many sports, or Michelle won't let me have the blueberry, or Michelle limits me to an hour a day on this, or Michelle won't let me do this. It's like, what do you mean she won't let you? Who the hell are you? What kind of a man are you, for God's sakes? I, I, I wouldn't want to hear that kind of thing from, from a baker. I wouldn't want to hear this from a guy who's, 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 who's changing the oil on my car. And you're telling me that the, um, that the president of the United States is telling me that he's completely run by this, uh, by this woman and, and that she runs his life and treats him like a boy? What the hell do you think that tells? Um, what do you think that tells other people? What do you think uh, that tells? Uh, hang on one second. Hello. Just missed it. Um, that's a call I had to take. That's the boy's mom. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, no, I don't, I don't let anybody talk to me that way uh, or about me that way. Uh, and she's just, you know, he's just a, he's just a, a wimp. I always has been. So there's that. And, um, I think the other thing I will say is just the, just the selfie aspect of it. This is extremely offensive to me. We're expected, um, we're expected to fly the flags of our entire nation at half mast for a foreigner out of respect for this man's tremendous, you know, uh, moral uh, whatever. I don't buy it for a second, but the fact is, so we're supposed to run our flags at half-mast for 10 days, and the president of the United States can't keep a straight face and not act like a child for for an hour in the, in the memorial service? Really? You don't realize that you're in front of people here? Honestly. And then the final thing I'll say, Jeremy pointed out, um, uh, Jeremy said, uh, he said, we're pretty good friends, right? I said, yeah. He said, how many selfies have we taken of each other? I said, none. He turned to another guy who works here named Jonathan. Jonathan, said, Jonathan, how many, uh, how many um, selfies have we taken together? He said, none. He said, that's right, because men don't take selfies with themselves. Men take selfies with other men? No. Men only take selfies with women. It's a flirty thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a romance thing. It's kind of like I'm here, a picture with this hot girl. Snap a picture. So I've taken selfies with lots of women, but I've never once taken a selfie uh, with another guy. So um, yeah, so of course he's flirting with him. I don't with her. I don't blame her. Uh, and Michelle, my God, of the two, she's the one that I just can't bear. And like I said, it takes somebody like Michelle Obama to make me feel sorry for Barack Obama. So there's that anyway. There's that kind of karmic punishment. Uh, two questions to go. Zachariah Tiemens again says, is there any objective case to be made for being masculine? Yeah, you just heard it. Um, you know, there's reason we're stronger than, than women and, and faster uh, and have a different kind of intelligence anyway. It's certainly more problem-solving intelligence, again, over millions and millions and millions of people. 
That's how the standard deviation breaks out. Of course, you can find women that are faster than some men and stronger than some men. But as a general rule, that's what we are. We're faster and we're stronger and uh, we're more logical. And uh, that gives us a certain skill set. And that skill set is the ability to, uh, mostly the ability to protect against other threats. It's why, one of the reasons why we're selected this way. And so um, you're going to want that threat response in between the threat and the, um, the, the people who you need to protect. And that tells me that's, that's where you need to stand. You need to stand out in front of them and protect them. Uh, it doesn't mean you're not equal. It doesn't mean you, you walk in front of them. You know, it really is a tremendously, remarkably interesting breakout of, of uh, skills and attributes between men and women in terms of who gets what. It's not like men have all of the advantages and women have none of them. It's really pretty much exactly a 50-50 thing. But some of the things that, that break out as different are, um, are the ability to, uh, to handle threats and... Uh, that, I think, is uh, making a pretty good case for being masculine. I, I know it's been my experience that men are capable of uh, generally detaching themselves from the emotional consequences of certain kinds of decisions and looking at the, at the longer-term consequences for this, and I think that's an important quality to have. I really do. doesn't mean that women can't do it. There's, there's millions of women that do it. There's millions of women in the military that do it right now. Um, but as a general rule... I think that, that this is generally, I think you can make the case that there are masculine and feminine qualities, even though there are some women that have masculine qualities, some men have feminine qualities. I have a quite, I have quite a large number of feminine qualities, actually. Uh, I have extraordinary taste. I have extraordinary uh, rhetorical skills. I'm good with people. I'm good with speaking. These are traditionally considered, uh, you know, sort of feminine feminine skills and that ability to understand how women work and how their minds work gives you a tremendous advantage if you're into women. Uh, so um, with that said, it, 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 there is, of course, an objective case for being masculine. And, and you can always tell when a society is out of balance. I think our society is way over-feminized right now. It's way, way, way over-feminized. Way too much into this safety at any cost, uh, way too much into this kind of, I don't want my feelings hurt and, and don't argue and no strife and, you know, and reduce competition, all that other stuff. But on the other hand, you certainly do not want to go into a world that is over, um, overly masculine because then you end up with Nazi Germany. I mean, really, that, that was the result of a society that was just so utterly 100% masculinized that it lost all of its um, reason for being there, frankly. It just became a, just became a death machine. You know, it's really what happens when you, when you reduce uh, feminine influence on uh, the mitigating influence and the, the influence of mercy and the influence of, uh, of, uh, of forgiveness and, and, and humanity and consequences. When you remove that, you end up with a, a, with a killing machine. And Nazi Germany was extraordinarily overly masculine society. Um, obedience, sacrifice, blood, iron, you know. I don't want to live in a world of blood and iron. I want to live in a world that's got all the nice things that the feminine qualities bring. I love, I love the fact that, that uh, women do things with decorating and clothes and see things that we don't see and colors and all this other stuff. I mean, they just, they just are astonishingly gorgeous creatures and, they, and everything they touch becomes better. Have you noticed that? You ever seen, you ever seen a, a lifelong bachelor pad from somebody who hasn't had any decent women around? It's just, you know, it's just a den. I mean, I lived in one of those for most of my life. Uh, and it's nasty. And, and, and every, time, um, every time women come into things, they just, they just buff it up a little bit. They, 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 everything just gets nicer. And uh, you see these old westerns, you know, it's really beautiful in the old American westerns where you get this hard-bitten guy out there on the frontier, you know, and he's just this prospector or this or that. And he's, uh, you know, he's living in this shack and it's got uncocked beams and, you know, wood floor and he gets a mail order bride or something and she comes in and she wants, you know, some calico and she wants some lace for the curtains. The next thing you know, this guy's got curtains. He's got dishes. He's got, you know, a carpet. And he never realized how nice all these things were until, until one of them came in. And, and for those of you who think I'm saying that's all women are good for us, not what I'm saying at all, at all, not at all. But I do um, think if you're going to talk about the idea of masculine and feminine, um, there is a world where these things are in balance, and I think our world is uh, is closer uh, to being in balance 
20 years ago. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I got to be crystal clear on this, not because I'm afraid of feminists, because I'm not afraid of anybody, really. Uh, but what I really w would like to say about this is, if you don't believe that everyone should have an opportunity, an equal opportunity, then I disagree with that position from the beginning. So I don't think that there are men's jobs and women's jobs. I'm not, I know excellent female pilots. My instrument instructor was a female pilot. Um, they're outnumbered 10 to 1, but the ones that are there are very good. And I don't, for an instant, think that anybody should be restricted on the basis of, of, uh, of their sex in terms of men or women being uh, de denied other jobs or jobs that may be considered a particularly feminine or particularly masculine job. I'm 100% against that. Needless to say... Needless to say, I think that any woman who does the same job as a man, including the same hours at the same risk, deserves exactly the same pay. I don't think they deserve more pay or less pay. I think they deserve the same pay. This giant um, income inequality that's being discussed uh, constantly by the feminists is usually a result of the fact that women, as a general rule, don't put in as many hours and don't work as dangerous jobs as men do. And dangerous jobs pay more. That's why they get people to do them. If you're going to ask somebody to risk their life on an oil rig every day, you're going to pay that guy more than you are a guy who's a crossing guard. So I just think it's really uh, tremendous. And uh, and all of the genuinely masculine men I know have a extraordinary uh, respect for women that borders on reverence, and that's the way it should be. And uh, those women should have a reverence for their men. And I think when a society's in balance, you find that. You find that the men are uh, just utterly willing to get in front of a bus for women. They walk on the they walk on the street side of the sidewalk. They get doors. They they do all these things. They're they're showing respect for women. They're not they're not waylaying women or, or or disrespecting them by getting the doors. They're they're putting their greater strength and their greater toughness at their service. They're putting themselves between the woman and traffic. They're basically saying if this car is going to jump the curve curb, it's going to hit me and not you. And uh, and that's that's marvelous. And I like I think likewise that a healthy society, the women in the world are 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 aware of the sacrifices that the men make, and they and they tell them they appreciate it, and they make them they make them feel like they're the king of the castle. Because ladies, if you want some insight into the male mind, the bottom line is every man in the world wants to be your knight in shining armor. They want to be your hero. They want to know that that you know that they're that they're working hard to uh, protect you and keep you fed and warm and safe. And uh, if you recognize that to them, if you let them know that you appreciate it, you've got them. Uh, and that's a whole other episode we can talk about. Last uh, question for the day from Max Wild. Good to see you, Max. It says, Bill, you're a snappy dresser. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you give guys any fashion tips for dressing well? Yes, go shopping with a woman um, and um, uh, make it a fashion model or movie star if you can. Uh, there is... Um, I would say probably the simplest thing I, I can tell you in terms of uh, whatever fashion sense I have is uh, comes out of um, what I would term a term that's not very uh, uh, in use anymore. But to me, a uh, really sharp dress is a result of breeding. Uh, breeding is a quality that, um, again, you don't, you don't hear much of anymore, but it's a, it's a certain sense of, of understatement. I think is really probably the essence of, of of breeding and refinement, and I think I think understatement is the key. I think really, when you look at the the black tuxedo, it's classic. I mean, it's classic. It's why James Bond wears a black tuxedo. I don't think I've ever seen Roger Moore. He would have been the only one wearing a frilly, uh, you know, blue or tangerine or forest green, you know, tuxedo. It's it's black. It's white. It's got a bow tie. It's got black studs. Maybe not the black studs. Maybe just white buttons but um it's classic and it's understated and it's clean um so what you're really looking for uh is um you're looking for elegance i think that's what i'm looking for right i'm not trying to i'm not trying uh, here's what I'm, I'm i'm speaking for myself i'm not looking for clothes that where, where you walk in the room and everybody goes wow that is the brightest color i've ever seen or that is the whitest lapel i've ever seen i've never seen a man carry that much gold what I want is I want somebody to look over and actually almost take like a second look like that is a that is a very well tailored suit and that is a very good combination of tie and, and shirt and colors. I like simple things. I don't like colored shirts. Generally, I like white shirts and, um, you know, and decent shoes. Look, guys, uh, it's not like I'm, you know, completely lost here. I mean, I have to have women tell me 
they look at your shoes. Because I never look at my shoes. I never look at a guy's shoes. I don't look at their shoes. I never once have I said to a guy, hey, man, nice shoes. You know, I hardly ever say that to a woman, except I've learned how to, you know, because you see some woman walk down the stairs, you know, coming out for a dinner or something. It's just like, oh, my God. But you really have to break it down, and you generally don't. Just go, wow, she looks great. Uh, so... Um, Great means everything's working for them. They got a handbag that matches their 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 uh, skirt and matches their blouse. They got shoes that match everything. They put it all together. They spend hours and hours and fortunes on it. And you have to look at it and you have to see it and recognize it. But I think really understated kind of is the thing. You want somebody to look at you and go, "Wow, that that guy has um, has really uh, chosen things that are that are kind of elegant and dark and well fitted and well made. Uh, not wearing big." YSL labels everywhere and you're not, you know, advertising anything. You just look like you've got the kind of uh, confidence to um, to do it. And I think confidence is the term, too. You know, it's like, um, you know, the, look, the one that I'll tell you what I live in mortal fear of. I've, I've lived in mortal fear of looking like I'm trying to dress young. I think that's catastrophic, you know. You're talking about trying to videos to reach young Americans. It's like I'm not going to be with their hoodie with a cap on. You know, and me laying down the fat beats is not going to be coming from me. You know, dress your age. I just live in a world where everybody wears jeans and a T-shirt. But, uh, yeah, just dress your age. That's the main thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just like, uh, you know, for me, I like vertical lines. I like thin lines. I, I like uh, thin lapels and, 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 and deep cut jackets. I really can't stand these kind of, you know, uh, jackets that these sports guys wear where your neck comes down to here and there's like four buttons and... No, I like I like vertical lines and kind of a trim kind of look and uh, dark colors and I don't like earth tones. I've never liked earth tones. Everything I wear is a gray or a or a blue. Uh, I don't like browns very much. That's just me. That's taste. But I think one of the greatest uh, one of the greatest one liners of all time was uh, uh, was George Goebel on um, on Hollywood uh, Squares, I guess. He was on uh, George Goebbels, I think it was. He was on Hollywood Squares, and he was in the corner, uh, down on one of the bottom squares, or somebody. Somebody asked him a question about George. He's always so shy, and he said, uh, "Maybe it was Tonight Show." He was on the Tonight Show. It was on the Tonight Show, I think. He said, uh, "He said, George, how you doing?" Uh, and and he turned to Johnny. He said, "Well, Johnny, do you ever feel that life was a tuxedo when you were a pair of brown shoes?" And I thought, man, oh man, that's uh, that's exactly right. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, don't, you know, I'm, I'm not a brown shoe guy. I got a couple of brown, uh, outfits, but I just don't like, uh, I don't like earth tones. I like grays and blacks and, uh, and blues, um, kind of those cool, darker kind of colors. I do have to say, I think the, ho the Hollywood, uh, look, I've gotten really used to it. I mean, the Hollywood, the Hollywood cool scene is, um, you wear a pair of, uh, dark wash jeans. Uh, weather jeans, dark wash, not blue, kind of black or dark, dark blue, and a uh, good pair of black shoes, a white button-down shirt, and a black blazer. That's pretty much the kind of California uh, look, and it's pretty pretty badass look, I have to say. With all of this said, though, guys, i got to tell you, I'm really brutally disappointed in all this. I really thought by the time we are into 2013 that um, I would be wearing my uh, electric blue um, spandex uh, you know, outfit with my cape, that would uh, detach for when I wanted to put on my jack jet pack. And, you know, we'd have badass kind of, you know, future future clothes, like the um, like the clothes in all of these pictures behind me here. Uh, if you go um, just Google Sid Mead, and you'll see everybody dressed in future clothes. And I, I really like the idea of future clothes, you know, like military high collars, and just, you know, kind of, you know, like these double-breasted cape things that button up like Starfleet uniforms, and everybody's wearing all this, you know, stuff. I'll tell you one thing. Uh... When I was a limo driver, I, I wore a dark suit. It was a really cool suit, too. And they said, no, you can't wear that for a company. I said, well, it's a great-looking suit. Said, yeah, well, it's not regulation. So they sent me to this guy in Pasadena. This would be about 1988. And uh, and this guy ran a, like a uh, it was like a Korean store or something. He wanted to bought a suit for like 70 bucks, a black, black suit for 70 bucks, And it was uh, it was triple-knit polyester. And... Um, and it was the most remarkable fabric in the world, honestly. It was it was freezing cold in the winter. It was boiling hot in the summertime, and it was 
plastic clothes, triple knit polyester, and I swear you could take a turkey dinner and just, you know, Thanksgiving turkey dinner and just throw it on you. And just, just basically just pour it over you like this and you could just take a, a wet towel and just wipe it off. Hideous. Hideous. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, fashion should be kind of fun. Uh, I, I shop at, uh, um, oh, what the heck is the name of that place? Do I have any, uh, oh, for the love of me. I just bought my last suit at a place called Extra, but I've been uh, shopping at um, an Italian place. It'll come back to me. I don't have it right now. Um, that's driving me nuts. Uh, 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 it's gone. I'm not going to try and get it either because it's late. And hey, look at that. We did another two hours and 20 minutes. This is getting out of hand. This show should be 90 minutes and is two and a half hours. It's a long time to torture 177, 178 people. But you stuck through it again. So um, if you got the time, I got the time. Uh, as always, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for all the um, the Facebook uh, comments. I read them all. I don't get to answer anything like as many as I would like, mind you. But uh, thank you very much for that. And um, and uh, it's been another uh, been another fun show. So uh, those of you out there uh, in uh, television land, I hope uh, hope you're not as cold as you seem to be. Uh, California has its advantages, um, and this is one of them. But, oh, I remember, I, I wrote a note down, by the way, uh, for, um, what was it? It applies to so many things. I guess it was the question about, um, I don't remember, oh, it's about the safety question. Uh, and somebody in the comments section, I, I just had to jump on this real quick. Somebody in the comments section mentioned uh, Mike Rowe from uh, Dirty Jobs. I'm actually friends with Mike Rowe. Um, I was at a, a meeting with him. Uh, a lunch with him, and I'd never met him before, and um, and and it was some video I did or something. So, he, and he was saying, you know, somebody said, "That's this some guy." I was so, somebody was talking about that Obama logo. I saw some guy doing a thing on like Obama logos and and what they all meant and how bad the GOP was. And and I looked at him. I said, "Really? Did that guy know what he was talking about?" And he looked at me. and said, "You're the guy." I said, "Yeah." And I just a huge fan. For those of you who are fans of Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs and the Ford commercials, Mike Rowe is the best guy I've ever met. He is the friendliest guy I've ever met. It, Mike Rowe is exactly the guy you think he is. He will sit down with absolute utter strangers and have a beer and talk to you like he's your like he's your best friend. Mike Rowe is just awesome. He's got the most American face I've ever seen. And um, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guy. And, um, and Mike Rowe did a show, and he talked about this thing that got him in a lot of trouble called Safety Third. And I'm paraphrasing it. But I think um, I think the one thing that he was basically saying is when you say f safety first, that's just not true. I think he was talking about like, the example he was giving me was we're doing like the fishing thing because Mike Rowe came up with the idea for um, Deadliest Catch. He narrated the Deadliest Catch. And he said, um, you know, if it was safety first, you wouldn't go. Right. I mean, if, if, if safety was the most important thing, you just wouldn't be out there doing this dangerous work. So safety isn't first. And he said safety isn't second because cost is second because you could make a boat that wouldn't overturn and it would cost, you know, $60 million and you could do all, any number of things that would reduce your catch significantly but would improve the safety. And you don't do it because safety isn't first and it's not second. The mission is first. The cost of the mission is second. Safety is third. That's a good number to have, safety third. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? You don't go with safety first. If safety first, safety first became NASA's mantra. And there's no point to have a NASA that has a operational strategy of safety first. Safety third. Do the mission first. Do the mission at some kind of cost where you can afford to actually go on the mission. And then once you've done those things ready, then then try to make it as safe as you can. Um, but anyway, uh, Mike Rowe, I just saw his name show up there. And I had to tell you, he's just absolutely the greatest guy, the greatest guy in the world. Uh as friendly as he can be, and does done, he's done an enormous service for the people of, of this country by doing dirtiest jobs for as long as he did to show us, you know, people that have to go in and clean out sewers and work in tanneries and, you know, pest control guys and, you know, guys that, that scoop up the dead animals off the highway. He's just an amazing dude. Um, he's just an amazing, amazing guy, and I'm so glad he's on our team, and he's, and he doesn't talk about it, which I admire. He doesn't, He's not doing this Sean Penn, Matt Damon thing, forcing his politics down other people's throats. He he has the uh, strange idea that you know people aren't interested in what he has to say politically. They they like him because of his TV shows, and he does the TV show, and that's all he does. And I admire him so much. 
so uh, he's a great guy. A great guy. Anyway, that's it for uh, Stratosphere Lounge episode number 50. Freaking one at 2 minutes and 30 seconds. It's time for us to go home. Uh, hopefully you guys will be able to find a way to not freeze to death overnight. That would be good for you. Good for me too. And um, thanks again for joining us as always. It's always a pleasure to be here talking to you good people. And uh, I guess we'll... I guess we'll see you next week. Okay, bye-bye now.